Initially, that we are about to start the 13th edition, we have Dr. H. P. Gonoria. Red, start kare. Right. The countdown to the 13th edition of the World Confluence of Humanity, Power and Spirituality has started and uh, right now we are going to commence with the auspicious lighting of the lamp. We have Dr. H.P. Canoria, the leading light uh, who has kept this flame enduring and alive for uh, since 2010 when we first started our confluence. Dr. H.P. Canoria, Srimati Champadevi Canoria, Hemant Canoria, Madhulika Canoria, uh, Sameen Canoria Ji, Sumita Canoria Ji, Raghav, Avanti, and all the auspicious uh, dignitaries, distinguished Avni, Aditya, the distinguished members of the family and guests present here today would now light the lamp and start this very, very one of a kind auspicious world confluence. Welcome all our viewers all over the world and let's have a very, very big and resounding applause. As you all know that uh, former heads of the state, including two former presidents of our country, uh, they have all been part of this confluence and uh, not only them, not only uh, political personalities, spiritual gurus uh, representing all kinds of religious fora, uh, but also most distinguished luminaries from all walks of life have made this world conference possible. It cannot be repeated too much that this is a challenging concept for uh, every uh, one of the members who have been keeping this flame alive. For the last uh, uh, 12 sessions, we have reached the 13th session, but perhaps the challenge was greatest this year with the raging pandemic. 13, as we know, uh, does not have very positive vibes. But uh, this year we thought maybe the pandemic is going to defeat us. But no, the world confluence is very much on. We have defeated the pandemic. It is, of course, being held uh, in the virtual platform this year, but uh, the enthusiasm, the quality of participation, everything remains the same. Dr. H. P. Canaria has made it absolutely sure that the world confluence, the one of its kind world confluence on spirituality, power and humanity does not slip even a bit from the high benchmark that it has set for itself. The wicks of the flame uh, light our path and the 13th edition is very much on. It has started. Avni and Aditya, they would be lighting the final wicks of the lamp. And with this beautiful visual, uh, with its metaphoric connection of removing darkness, showing us the path. Uh, 
is definitely uh, going to be an enduring symbol of the world confluence. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Dr. H.P. Kanoria, his family members, our esteemed guests, uh, starting the World Conference. We thank all the members. Uh, and as they take their seats in the auditorium, we would request Dr. H.P. Kanoria to stay back and uh, introduce and welcome every one of you. Dr. H. V. Kanoria is truly an authority on uh, spirituality, and uh, we look forward to his welcome address where he incorporates his philosophy, his vision of life, his unique perception and concept of spirituality. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. May we now request Dr. H.P. Kanoria to kindly take over. Dr. H.P. Kanoria wears many hats. As we all know that he is a renowned industrialist, a banker, a journalist, educationist, philanthropist, social awakener, and of course, last but not the least, the founder of the world confluence of humanity, power, and spirituality. A worldwide mission to serve humanity and arrive at more and more evolved uh, awareness of spirituality. May we now request Dr. H. P. Kanoria to take over and welcome all our viewers all over the world. Welcome all to the 13th World Confluence of Unity, Power and Opportunity. On behalf of my family and myself, I wish you and your family a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I deeply express my gratitude to all eminent speakers for their gracious presence to lighten years. Their relevance will imbibe and ignite the spirituality to us. We will wonder that what is the right confluence of humility, power, and spirituality? It is the confluence that all the religions are get together and humility get together for the sake of the humility. How to serve the humility? Paman Sri Ramakrishna has said, serve the unity that is the worship of the God. And power, we have got the inner power and outer power. So we have to balance the power, outer power, that is the power of money, muscles, and power. And inner power that we have to unite and imbibe the inner power which the God has given. The inverse is the manifestation of universal father, God. God is our father, mother, and friend. God is not alone. He said, I am alone. Let there be many. Eko ham bahon shami. God has manifested. Yes, in his own image. We are in unit of his cosmic divine intelligence. We are perfect and divine. God is seated in the hearts of all beings. God is the force within us. In what is unity and diversity? Lord Krishna has said to his disciple Arjuna on the better in the Mahabharata, the entire universe has been manifested from my form. All these are dependent on me, but I am not dependent on them. My Atat I am seated in the hearts of all beings. He is everywhere, the pure and formless one, the Almighty. He is the source of all strength. He is worshipped through devotion and love, love for his love set. He is all merciful. We are punished for our own action as the reaction for all for every action. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent. God is everywhere and in everything. Two things order. Authority, simplicity, hard work, devotion, 
unity and unity upon Mother Earth to do us bounty to live a full span of life happily and united amidst diversity in the grace free from ego. A span of life as given by the God in hundred years. Unity the sense of all Indian, a spiritually embice and advice one to work hard with devotion, righteously, fearlessly and selflessly to create and generate wealth. Let us have the cosmic cooperative aspect, a spirituality manifest divinity within. It creates the international bondage, one family, one world. A spirituality infuses the elements of balance and happy living in the physical and mental state with all. Intellectual faculty and intuition are developed. Life is balanced. So it is essential to specialize the while living in the world and discharging beauty with devotion. Feel the presence of God in thoughts and action. The, he will guide our thoughts and action. We will welcome the storms of the life without courage and joy. A sweetity gives the depth of intelligence and intuition to cross the ocean of problems. Go conspire with the person who works righteously with the two aspects of the Almighty. What is the two aspects of the Almighty? It is the welfare of all, protect the universe. Swami Vivekananda said, if you give up a spirituality, the wealth will be that in three generations we will achieve. The river, the river of material war dies up quickly. We need to change ourselves. Well, we change. Immortal soul is embodied in the mortal body. We are the soul of immortal bliss. We listen to and foster a spirituality. Let loving thoughts come to us from everywhere. The world is facing unprecedented and challenging time. We can only try the world this is a storm by building up our spiritual muscles of iron and nerves of steel. Let us march ahead with firmness and determination, keeping high the flag of humility and the spirituality to manifest the divinity to overcome global hunger and global warming. Even in the battlefield of Mahabharata, Lord Krishna has told Arjuna to do your work righteously. Do your work. So while in this world, we hold the feet of the lotus, feet of the God, and do our work righteously. The sense of the religion is cosmic cooperation and coexistence. God calls, God calls all children, relies all in one, one in all. Let us be with the universal unity and diversity. Swami Rana said, feel the reflection of God in all human beings. And I would like to tell a, a story from the book how to respect the parents. And Lord Vishnu told Narad, find out a beauty and mother of mine. Narad came to the earth and he returned back and he said, the grandson is a beauty and lover. God said, no, he is not my lover and beauty. Come along with me to the earth. He came to the on the earth and went to the house of Bishamba, a money, money merchant, wealthy merchant. Now I called Bishamba that Lord Vishnu has come, come. Bishamba said, no, I am serving my parents. I am giving the bath to them. Wait there. Half an hour then, then again Narad called. Vishamba said, I am feeding my parents. 
with trees. And ten years passed after that December came and fell on the feet of lotus, feet of the Lord Vishnu. Tears were flowing from his eyes. Lord Vishnu blessed him. No, it is the duty to care for the parents, nurture the parents. And I am very pleased with you. The Lord Lakshmi, Mother Lakshmi, and I will live in your house forever. Om Amin Amin Ekulkara Avla Malda. Thank you all for your presence. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We thank Dr. H.P. Kabarwa. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful introduction uh, to the World Conference. And uh, now we move on uh, and invite one of our most awaited uh, for speakers, uh, Mr. Shiv Khera. Chief Kheraji, as we all know, is an author of repute, he's an educator, he's a business consultant, and of course, a much sought after speaker. He inspires and encourages individuals to realize their true potential. He has taken his dynamic uh, personal messages, his very own way of thinking, uh, to the world, all across the globe, and uh, 40 years of research and understanding has put millions on the path of growth and fulfillment. The pandemic had uh, created unique opportunities for all people all over the world to listen to Chef Kiraji and he has done more than 100 webinars and millions of people all over the world had logged on to his webinars and had been benefited in various ways. Uh, uh, Chef Kiraji is already with us today and uh, he is a brand ambassador of the Round Table Foundation, uh, a very positive person who is able to bring out the positives out of everyone. And that is why his talk today would be on turning setbacks into comebacks. In the time of the pandemic, where positive is perhaps the most negative word, we really need to hear from this genius who had coined this extraordinary line. Words don't do different things, they do things differently. Please welcome Chief Kheraji. Thank you very much. Am I already there? Yes, you are. Am I audible? Hello? Am I audible to you? Am I audible to you? Can you just say hello or yes something? Hello? Am, am I audible to you? Chief Kheraji is online and we are about to hear him speak. Am I audible to you? Can you respond please? Am I audible to you? Ma'am, am I audible to you? Well, can you respond please? Am I audible to you? I am about to hear him speak. Am I audible to you? Can you respond please? Am I audible to you? Yes. Yes, yes you are, sir. Ma'am, am I audible to you? Absolutely. Okay. Because your voice is very muffled. Please, please continue. Can you respond to it? Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. You are audible about to share the speech. Am I audible to you? Am I audible to you? Yes. Yes, yes, you are, sir. Am I audible to you? Absolutely. Okay. Because your voice is very beautiful. Please, 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 
There's a lot of disturbance. I, I don't know what's the matter. There's a lot of disturbance right here. I mean, I don't know. How can you talk and how can you listen? So. So Rajiv, there's so much of disturbance coming from there. Hmm. It is so much of static in there, noise all over. Mm -hmm. I mean, now they've just gone away, but uh, it's impossible to talk and even we can't even listen to them properly. And uh, I keep talking, they're not even responding. I mean, it seems there's a time lag. By the time I'm talking, it takes mm -hmm. another few minutes. By the time they say, oh, I've heard you. Now they say yes. So I don't know what the whole, what thing is all about. I mean. Uh, how can you figure out because with the, so much of disturbance, how do you talk? No, you're talking. Your phone is this is no, no, I'm on here. I mean, I'm I'm on here and uh, I have no idea. So, and uh, when they were on, there was so much of disturbance both sides. I mean, you can't even listen to anybody, uh, what's up? and they were not even responding when I was asking. Till, till after some time. Folks, sorry about the glitch. Can they hear now? No, I'm I'm okay now. I'm I'm just turned off. This is okay. Everything is okay here. Can they give us a go ahead? Can you hear me, Can you hear me, Can you hear me, Yep. Can they hear me? No, we're okay now. Okay. Well, folks, sorry about the glitch on the technology side, but I congratulate the Spirituality and the Humanity Foundation. Well, our title is Turn Setback into Comeback. All I can say is this uh, crisis has gone from one city to another, covered the whole world, and the world is feeling 
it's shaken up the whole world. They're feeling insecure. And it is causing a lot of stress, anxiety, frustration, depression, and even anger. And none of us have all the answers. Certainly, I don't. But all I can say is, folks, stress is both normal and natural. Anybody who says they have no stress belongs in the lunatic asylum. Now, all stress is not bad. In fact, it is stress that makes us perform. Folks, have you seen at the athlete at the Olympics? Is he under stress? Answer is yes. If he was not, there's no way he could perform. Now, the only example that I can think of is the race course, either we have seen in the real life or in the movies, the thoroughbreds, when they are being taken into the cabin, they're not walking casually relaxed. They're all jumping like this. Why? They're under very heavy stress. And after they put in the cabin, the moment the bell rings, immediately they run, they perform. Now that's a thoroughbred. But if you take a jackass to the race course, this jackass is walking so relaxed, comfortable, cool. He's not jumping like up and down like the thoroughbreds, but then he will always remain a jackass and never perform like a thoroughbred. So my only thing is stress is the price we pay to be a thoroughbred in life. I repeat one more time. Stress is the price we pay to be a thoroughbred in life. Now, folks, all of us can handle stress. What we cannot handle is chronic stress. I repeat, all of us can handle stress. What we cannot handle is chronic stress. That is the time we start breaking down. Folks, think about it. How come under the same set of circumstances, some people break records while others break themselves? How come? Identical circumstances. Now, this crisis has impacted us three ways. One, impacted our life, two, our livelihood, and three, our lifestyle. How has it impacted our life? Folks, none of us know who will be in quarantine next, nobody knows. And what we do and where we go and who we meet could be a matter of life and death. That's the life part. The second is the livelihood component is now all over the world, there are three kinds of people the super rich, the mediocre, and the poor. The poor people are the worst hit. They're the daily wage earners. They work during the day, eat in the evening. They're the worst hit. Now comes the super rich. Super rich, they don't have a livelihood problem nor a cash flow problem. I was just reading last week, Apple Computers has $250 billion in cash reserve. Now, they don't have a cash flow problem. And similarly, the Adani, the Ambani's, I don't think they have a cash flow problem. I'd be surprised. Now, that leaves the mediocre. Mediocre people are like me and some of the listeners. They are thinking, will the crisis finish before the money or will the money finish before the crisis? That is a big concern. Now, every few years, you hear a buzzword. A few years ago, the buzzword used to be startup, startup, startup. So everybody was starting up. And then the buzzword came, made in India, make in India, make in India. But now the new buzzword is work from home. Folks, maybe in the IT industry, you can possibly work from home. But how can you work from home in a construction industry? How can you work from home in a manufacturing industry? You can't. Well, there are some real issues. But now the big issue comes in is, I had a banker visit me the other day and I asked him, how is the work from home working out? You are paying salaries. Are you getting the output from them? He said, Mr. Kera, the 80-20 rule applies. And the 80-20 rule says, only 20% of people are responsible. They can work without supervision. But the 80% people still need supervision. Even if you give them measurable targets, they still need supervision. And sadly, people who are not mature they think working from home is a paid vacation. It's not. So important thing is there are major concerns that come in here. Now comes the livelihood part. Now, till the lockdown came in, all of us were in the fast lane. We were running, running, running. We had no time. Now look at the paradox. The amount of time-saving devices we have today, we have never had that many in history. 
And yet we don't have what? We don't have time. Now, why don't we have time? Because somewhere we messed up our priorities. And I'm not just giving lectures here. I'm guilty myself. And when we mess up our priorities, we forget to distinguish between what's urgent in life and what's important in life. Folks, urgent may or may not be important and important may or may not be urgent. But the interesting thing is, whenever we ignore what is important, it always converts into urgent. Now look at this, health is important, but it's not urgent. You see, exercising every day is important, but it's not urgent. If, if I have a crucial meeting tonight and if I cannot exercise, it's not the end of the world. But if I ignore my health long enough, guess what happens? I land up in the hospital. See, interesting thing is, whenever we ignore what is important, it always converts into urgent. Now in life, relationships are important, but they're not urgent. But when we ignore relationship long enough, guess what happens? We start talking to our lawyers. Now folks, what this crisis has done is, it made people step backwards and to reevaluate the priorities. You ask people, why do you go to work? I go to work for my family. Why do you work hard? I work hard for my family. Who are the most important people in your life? My family. Who are the most neglected? Also my family, what a joke. Sadly, the most important people many times become the most neglected too. And what this crisis has done is made people step backwards and say, reevaluate our priorities and see the direction. Till now, we were running all right, but we need to check where we're running in the right direction. And now people have realized in life, direction is much more important than speed. I repeat, in life, direction is much more important than speed, and that is crucial. Now, with that in mind, I, I do want to mention something rather crucial on the livelihood side. See, going back about 45 years ago when I left India, went to US, I'm not that educated. I'm a BCom third division. I failed my 10th. I come from a business family. We had coal mines. Women to coal, they were nationalized. And we literally came on the street. Street means street. Now, some families had money. Our family did not because my father had died when I was in college, we were left the liabilities and the assets were gone. And I was married just four weeks then. And I remember a year, year later, my daughter was born. And I saw some of the last piece of my mother's jewelry to get released from the hospital. I did not have 10 bucks to buy milk that night. I tried my hands on three businesses with no money and I failed in all three. Finally, November 13, 1975, I left India, went to US, initially went to Toronto, and started life with a bucket in my hand, washing cars door to door. For about a year and a half, I was washing cars. And totally by accident, I got into selling life insurance. And within three months, my manager called me back to fire me for non-performance. Now, from this point onwards, what changed my life, I became a multi-million dollar producer, moved on to the US, got into three businesses. I bought out a company out of California in 1984. Started a New Jersey operation with no clients. And I sold my company with close to 500 clients for a decent sum. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Very important reason. See, while I was selling life insurance, I was on 100% commission. I would not get paid any money till I sold. But I saw there were some people who were on salaries and they were not doing the job. And that is the time I understood the difference between making money versus earning money. Making money is criminal, earning money is spiritual. Are you with me? Making money is criminal, earning money is spiritual. Now, what is the difference between them? When we earn money, we put our energy and ethics behind it. That is called earning money. And that is where we started talking of wages without work amounts to stealing. And all these things, I don't think any school and college is teaching today anywhere in the world. And sadly today, most people want to make money, very few want to earn money, and that is sad. Now folks, 
there are only two examples through history where similar crisis we have faced. One was the Spanish flu. I'm sure you've heard enough times, I'm not gonna repeat myself. But I'd like to just say one thing, that Spanish flu came in 1918 and it went away and people thought the danger was over. But it came back the second phase in 1919 and killed 50 million people were dead and that is sad. So I'm just saying that because many places the second phase is not even there or it's coming. And in US, close to 300,000 people are dead. And they're saying the second phase is not even there. In India, close to 160,000 people are dead. All I'm saying is just because the lockdown is over doesn't mean the danger is over. Now, the second part was the Great Depression of 1929. The banks failed, stock market collapsed, people lost their savings, and $100 became $15. And 15 million people became unemployed. Now, 15 million 100 years ago is equivalent to 50 million today because the population of the US was only 120 million at that time. And folks, I just checked last week, close to 50 million people in the US are unemployed. Now here is the silver lining. Research and experience shows that whenever unemployment goes up, self-employment always goes up. I repeat, whenever unemployment goes up, self-employment always goes up. Now during the Great Depression, when people had no money, no risk-taking ability, no education, no technology. There were some people who started their business during that time, and today, they are household words. And I'm gonna share only three examples, and what they had was, they were solution-focused people. If you notice, there are some people who are problem-focused in life. You know what that means? You give them a solution, they'll give you a problem. They have a problem for every solution. Henry Ford said, kick them out. Kick them out. We're not stupid. We understand there are problems. But we need somebody who is solution focused. Now, folks, I'm going to share only three examples with you. One was a man by the name of George Jenkins. He started a retail outlet in his neighborhood of non-perishable durable goods. Now these two words are very important. Non-perishable means if they perished, means 100% loss. Durable means if they can't sell, at least they could use it. This is how we started 100 years, ago, 100 years ago. And today, his turnover is $30 billion, net worth $6 billion, and he has 1,000 retail outlets in the US. And the store's name is called Publix Supermarket. Second example, there were two brothers in California, Gallo brothers, they were struggling. They caught hold of some grapes, made wine out of it, but then nobody had money to buy it. They started selling the wine at 50% below market. And today, Gallo wine is accounts for 25% of wine trade in the US and valuations are close to $10 billion. And third example was a man by the name of Simplot. He had a patch of land, he started cultivating potatoes. Now what he couldn't sell, they ate, what he couldn't eat started rotting. Now he could not afford the loss of rotten potatoes, so he started freezing them. This is how he started 100 years ago, and today he accounts for 33% of the French fries business in the US with close to $12 billion in valuation. Now, folks, I don't want to leave my listeners with the impression that you and I start any business and all of us will become billionaires. That is not the message. The message is only one thing, that many of these people faced much, much bigger problems than we are facing. But they were solution focused. And all we need is today to become solution focused. And I want to repeat, think about it. How come under the same set of circumstances, some people break records while others break themselves. How come? Identical circumstances. Now, how do we overcome this crisis? Let me share with you some steps if I have time enough. Normally I cover nine steps, but at least I'll find 
time to do at least four or five today. Folks, the way to overcome the crisis is the first one is the serenity prayer. About 45 years ago, I attended a program by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the man who wrote the book, Power of Positive Thinking. There were close to a thousand people. Dr. P came, looked at everybody and said, you people appear so cool, calm, comfortable. It appears nobody has a problem here. Then he asked, does anybody have a problem here? Who doesn't have it? So everybody raised their hand. We all have problems. Then he asked, how many people would like to get rid of the problem? Again, everybody raised their hand. And then Dr. Peel said, while I was coming here, I came across a place where I saw some people lying down, all stretched out, comfortable. They have no problem whatsoever. How many people would like to know where that place is? Everybody raised their hand. And then Dr. Peel said, two blocks away from here, there is a cemetery. There is a cemetery. There are people lying there, all stretched out, comfortable. They have no problem whatsoever. Then he asked, how many people would like to get rid of their problem? Nobody raised their hand. Everybody put their hand in their pocket. And then Dr. Peel said, remember, problem is a sign of life. So long as we are alive, we shall have problems. The day we don't have problems, we'll be dead. And when you're running short of problems, that is the time to get on your knees and pray to God and say, have you stopped trusting me anymore? Send me some problems. And that day, he gave a prayer, which is called the serenity prayer. In my opinion, it is the crux of life. And in the past 45 years, I have never left my home without the prayer and I've come across a lot of adverse situations and this prayer has helped me tide over. I'll say twice, one in English, once in Hindi. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change and courage to change the things that I can and wisdom to know the difference what I can and what I cannot. परमात्मा मुझे संतुलन दो जो मैं बदल नहीं सकता आपकी सौगात समझ के स्वीकार करूं और अगर बदल सकता हूं तो मुझे इतनी हिम्मत और हौसला दो कि मैं उसे बदल दूं और इतनी सुबुद्धि दो कि उनमें फर्क बता सकूं क्या बदल सकता हूं और क्या मैं नहीं बदल सकता फोर्स इफ यू डाई सेट दिस प्रेयर एंड एनालाइज इट सेज इट ऑल God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Let me ask you, can we change everything in this world the way we want it? Answer is no. Can we manipulate and adjust things to suit ourselves? Answer is no. There are many things beyond us, such as, I didn't choose my parents, neither did you. I didn't decide where I was going to be born, neither did you. If this is my height and the color of my skin, there's nothing I can do. And granted, sometimes people are born deformed. And sometimes bad things do happen to good people for no fault of their own. What wrong did they who do? Who knows? How did this crisis come? I don't know, but it's here. See, it says, what I cannot change, let me accept it graciously, not grudgingly. Why? Because many times in life, we keep fighting the things we just cannot change. And we bring stress into our lives and we become paralyzed and we become unproductive. And it says, if I can change, then give me the guts to do it. And wisdom to know what I can and what I cannot. Now, when I wrote my new book, You Can Achieve More, which was launched in London last year, year and a half ago, I took this thought two steps forward and I wrote in that life is full of choices and life is full of compromises. Seems like a contradiction, but not really. Now, how is life full of choices? See, if I ill-treat you, I've chosen to be ill-treated, haven't I? If I treat you with discourtesy, I've chosen to be treated with discourtesy, haven't I? And if I light up a cigarette, I've chosen to invite cancer, haven't I? And if I drink and drive, 
I've chosen to invite an accident, haven't I? And if I exercise every day, I've chosen to invite good health, haven't I? And if I eat too much every day, I've chosen to be obese, haven't I? And if I tell lies, I have chosen to lose my credibility, haven't I? And if I tell the truth, I've chosen to be a credible person, haven't I? See folks, life is full of choices. Now, very important thing, we are all free to the point of choice, but after we make our choices, the choice controls the chooser. We have no more choice. Our freedom stops. I repeat, we are all free to the point of choice, but after we make our choices, the choice controls the chooser. We have no more choice. Now, how is life full of compromises? Folks, as somebody said well, in life, we cannot choose the cards that are dealt to us. What we can choose is how we play the game. And sometimes nature gives us a lemon, the choice is ours. Do we cry or do we make lemonade? That's a choice we make. Now, many times people ask me, Mr. Kira, people who are successful, don't they make mistakes in life? And people who fail, don't they do positive things in life? And my answer is that people who are successful, they do make mistakes. But remember, making a mistake once in a while does not bring failure. Repeating the same mistake again and again is what brings failure. And doing something positive once in a while does not bring success either. Repeating the same positive behavior again and again is what brings success. And that is the key here all the way. Now, that is step one. And step two says, folks, convert your wasted time to productive time. How do you do that? I read somewhere two weeks ago that Nelson Mandela was in jail for 27 years. And somebody asked him after he became the president, Mr. Mandela, how did you survive 27 years in jail? And Mandela said, I was not surviving, I was preparing. Man, what an answer. I was not surviving, I was preparing. And from there we deciphered a quotation which says, I will not let this crisis define me. I will use this crisis to define me. So convert to wasted time to productive time. How do you do it? Folks, a survey was conducted in the US. This was before the crisis. It said an average American watches three to four hours of television per day. This is before the crisis. Right now there are people watching eight, 10 hours. And by the way, it is not average American. It is average European, Indian, Australian, everywhere they're watching three to four hours of TV per day. So a man went to his friend who used to watch four, four hours of TV per day and he asked him, how much did this TV cost you? So the friend said, cost me a thousand dollars. He said, you don't know how to calculate things in life. He said, have you ever calculated your monetary value of your time? He said, no, but if I make $100,000 per year, and if I work 2000 hours per year, my hourly rate comes to $50 an hour. And he said, you watch four hours of TV per day, 50 multiplied with four, $200 per day, multiplied 365, that comes to close to $100,000 per year. He said, this TV is not cost you a thousand bucks. It is costing you $100,000 per year, which is more than your EMI in a million dollar home. Folks, you don't know how to calculate things in life that was he was told. Now, don't get me wrong. We all watch TV, we like it, there's a nice movie, it relaxes us. But tell me, watching four hours TV per day, what are you doing? You're wasting your life. Now, in my book, you can achieve more. I've given a survey which said that 85% of millionaires and billionaires in the world are first generation. Only 15% are coming from inheritance. And they were asked, how come 
you gain so much of financial success in such a short time? And the answer was, we read books. What kind of books? We read only self-help books. We don't read fiction. We have no time to waste. And they were asked, how many books do you read? And they said, we read 50 books a year. Multi-millionaires and billionaires read 50 books a year. 50 books means a year means one book a week. One book a week. Folks, I was reading on Warren Buffett. He reads six to eight hours per day. Bill Gates is an avid reader. And the multimillionaires, they read one book a week. What does it tell us? That there is a connection between learning and earning and learning and earning and learning and earning. Learn more, earn more. And there is a connection here. But there are many people who said, I don't have the time, I don't have the money. Well, God knows what. These are multimillionaires giving us a clue but today you can get any book for free in a library. And uh, I found one thing, that a serious reader will never borrow or lend books, never. Many times people come and tell me, Mr. Kira, I got a great new book. I can lend it to you. I said, don't. Either give it to me, gift it to me, sell it to me, don't lend it to me, why? Because I won't give it back to you, why? Because when I read a book, I always underline, make notes on the side, why? Because I learned one thing. Reading a good book once is not good enough. Why? Because when you read a book second time, you don't find anything new in the book, but you find something new in yourself. When you read the third time, fourth time, fifth time, you find something new in yourself. Folks, Arrow Electronics from US, a $26 billion company, they're my clients. They just celebrated their bumper quarter $2 billion of sale in 90 days during the lockdown period. And they had a big awards function. I keynoted them. And I asked him, I said, tell me, what is the reason for your success? He said, Mr. Kera, I attended your program 15 years ago. I bought all your books. And he said, everybody, all my staff, I gave all the books to everybody. And he said, we've read your book 20 times, 20 times. And he said, if you ever forget a paragraph from your own book, call me, I'll tell you where it is. He said, we read your book every, every year. And there are people who tell me, I've read your book once. I said, you wasted your time and money. You haven't got anything out of it. Folks, all I can say is that during this lockdown period, you need to upskill yourself. Upskill yourself. Folks, lockdown came in March. I did my first webinar in, uh, on April 8th. Till April 8th, I was learning to do SMS for my grandchildren. I had never done an email in my life. I didn't know how to turn the computer on. I learned this now. I'm not an expert, but I'm operating. And from April 8th to now, I have done 119 webinars. This is the 120th webinar tonight. And by the way, people are paying us for it. It has opened up a new avenue for us and I'm giving out dates in January. What I'm saying is, we, this is time to upskill. Look, Mandela said, this was preparation time. We need to understand that. Okay. Step three, step three. Folks, to overcome any stress, build strong relationships. Folks, remember, Our greatest asset in life is not our bank balance. It is our relationship balance. <clears throat> and I've learned one thing, that people who have good relationships, what they can achieve with one phone call, you cannot achieve with a million dollars. This is how crucial relationships are. And I address business schools, many parts of the world. And nowadays in the business school they're teaching to build networking, networking, networking. And you ask them, why are you networking? So they join the Rotaries, the Lions, or the Chamber of Commerces, and you ask them, what is the purpose? And the answer is, I'm networking, networking. And you ask them, why are you networking? I'm networking because I'm building contacts. Why are you building contacts? Because someday he could be useful. He's a doctor, he's a lawyer, he's a politician, he's a whatever. Someday he could be useful. Now, usefulness finishes, friendship also finishes. Look at this. They don't understand the difference between 
There's a big difference between building contacts versus building relationships. I repeat, there's a big difference between building contacts versus building relationships. See, people who are building contacts so that you can be useful, usefulness grows, friendship grows too. You can never build relationship with people like that. You know why? They are parasites, they are rascals, they're only here to take. They're only here to take. Their selfishness, it doesn't work that way. See, we have an office in Singapore. And uh, one evening I came from dinner and a man met me in the lobby and he asked me, Mr. Kira, you came from dinner? I said, yes. You met some people tonight? I said, yes. He said, I hope you met some people who could be useful. See, his only criteria was usefulness. What he could extract out of you. I felt like giving a piece of my mind. See, he doesn't understand that in life, meeting good people is good enough. Usefulness is a byproduct of relationship. Now, supposing I have a friend of 20 years and tonight if he has a problem, who is the most natural person he will go for help to? A friend of 20 years. He's not going to make new friends tonight. Now, is it my duty to help? Answer is yes. If I help him, am I doing a favor? No. Keep in mind, helping a friend is a duty of a friend, never the purpose of friendship. Why? Because if it's a purpose, Purpose finishes and friendship finishes too. Keep in mind, helping each other is a duty of a friend, never the purpose of friendship. Now, a very important thing that we talk here, what builds relationship? I've heard many people talk of spirituality and they keep talking of the word tolerance. And they say, you should be tolerant, tolerant, tolerant. Folks, in my vocabulary, tolerance is not a great word. The word I would replace is with mutual respect. I repeat the word. The word is mutual respect. I give you an example. I and my wife live together, not because we can tolerate each other. We live together because we respect each other. If we only live together because we tolerate each other, it is a matter of postponing the blast. Same thing, employers and employees work long term together, not because they can tolerate each other. They work together because they respect each other. But the day respect for each other goes, you can't work together. Tolerance only means we are postponing the blast. And what builds a relationship? To build a relationship, we must learn to add a value addition to another person's life. And how do you add a value addition to another person's life? By learning to give in life. You can't be a parasite, only a taker. We must learn to give. In fact, what I'm just sharing with you in the last 45 minutes, I don't know of any school and college that is teaching all this stuff. My two girls have done their masters in US. Now, we do corporate training for the past 35 years. And uh, we tell our people that when we do corporate training, we are doing the repair work. That is called repair. Now we say, if we prepare them, you won't have to repair them. Where do you prepare them? You prepare them in schools and colleges. And sadly, our schools and colleges are not teaching this stuff today. I had a dean of James Cook University from Australia attend my program. And he said, Mr. Kera, we want your program to be done in our Singapore office. So they partnered with us. And uh, now we're doing a program for them in Singapore, James Cook University. So we have created a program for schools and colleges called Prepare Them, Don't Repair Them. Prepare them, don't repair them. Okay. So much for relationship. Now, next one is, we need to become a proactive person. Proactive, proactive. Folks, when we do our leadership programs, we ask people, are you a good person? And sometimes people say, yes, I'm good. You ask them, what makes you good? And they say, well, I don't do bad, so I'm good. 
I don't tell lies, I don't cheat, I don't steal, so I'm good. And my answer is, I disagree with your answer. Folks, not doing bad does not make a person good. And if I don't tell lies, it only means I'm not a liar, but that does not make me good. And if I don't steal, it only means I'm not a thief, but that does not make me good. See, folks, a per go ask a medical doctor. Absence of ill health does not mean good health. Not being bad does not make a person good. A person must do good in order to do proactive to be proactive. You must be proactively doing good in order to become a good person. So become a proactive person. Now, why do I share this? I've been doing leadership training for the past 35 years. And I've learned one thing, that a good leader takes a stand for something and takes a stand against something. A good leader is never neutral. And if you're neutral, you're a politician. Why am I sharing this with you? Because once I finished the program, I was addressing about 5,000 students. And a man from the audience came up and he said, Mr. Kera, are you a Gandhian? So I learned one thing. Before you answer a question, sometimes you need to clarify the question. And two, sometimes the best answer to a question is a question. So I asked him, sir, can you define a Gandhian? Can you give me the criteria of being a Gandhian? What are the principles of being a Gandhian? He said, well, Gandhi stood on three principles. One, Gandhi believed in with love, you can win everybody. Two, Gandhi believed in principle of tolerance. Three, Gandhi believed in the principle of non-violence. And then he asked me, are you a Gandhian? I said, sir, I've been living in the US for the past 45 years, but I'm in India. And uh, we respect our epics, the Ramayana, the Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharat. I've not read them, but I've heard them. So I don't know what came to my mind. I asked him, sir, can you tell me, was Ram a Gandhian? Let us look at your three pins of being a Gandhian. One, with love, you can win everybody. Tell me, was Ram able to win with love? Answer is no. Ram failed the first test. Two, you said tolerance. Did Ram say, I'm a very tolerant person. You kidnapped my wife. It's okay. I'll get a second one. You'll kidnap a second one. I'll get a third one. You'll kidnap a third one. I'll get a fourth one. Did he say that? He said, no, I do not tolerate kidnappers. Three, you said nonviolence. I said, what did Ram do? He had to pull out his weapon and kill the evil and destroy him. He killed even for self-defense, that is violence. So I said, Ram failed three tests. So that means Ram was not a Gandhian. Ram didn't say I'm neutral. And Ram didn't say I have unconditional love. And Ram also didn't say, I must look at things from the other person's point of view. Well, how can you look at it from a kidnapper's point of view? You become a kidnapper if you do. Folks, why go that far? Look at our life histories of 10 Sikh Gurus. When the Mughals were forcibly converting into Islam, was the 10th Guru, was he able to win with love? Answer is no. Did he say I will tolerate the terrorism? He said no. Did he pull the weapon? He said yes. So he was not a Gandhian either. I said, you keep talking of our scriptures. And that is what people talk of spirituality and scriptures. And I said, show me one of your scriptures, one place where your scripture says that when the enemy is auctioning the respect and dignity of your women and children, where does it say at that time you should go and do bhajan kirtan meditation in the temples? Where does it say that? That is the time to fight. If, if that was not the case, if with love you could win everybody, you would have not had any Ramayana, you would not have any Bhagavad Gita, you would not have any Mahabharata. They, they were non-existent, they would not be existing at all today. And I said, not fighting is called cowardice. That is not tolerance. And I said, sir, I'm not a Gandhian. I am not a Gandhian. I just want to close this program with one little thing. And that is, Many times we confuse a lot of things under the guise of spirituality. I want to make it very clear. 
for people to overcome any crisis, we need to accept responsibility. I repeat, we need to accept responsibility and stop playing the blame game in this world. And one of the biggest damage done to India has been done by our media, print media, or even the electronic media. Anytime you turn the, open the TV, what do you see? Horoscope. And what do you see? You see there, there is a Babaji there, with the saffron or the white, and with Tilak here, and he says, where are you calling from? What is your name? What is your date of birth? What is your time of birth? He says, Guruji, I don't know. And then he says, don't worry, I will pull it out. And he has the laptop there. And he does tick, 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 tick. And then he says, you have patni dosh, putri dosh, pita dosh, phalana dosh, this dosh, dash dosh. And he says, you are manglik, manglik, manglik. And then he says, you got shani on you. Aapne shani chal gaya, shani chal gaya, shani chal gaya. Now this guy is scared. And he said, how do I get rid of shani? He said, well, shani ko utarne ka upai ye hai. Take a black handkerchief, put a black doll in it, and then put a black kajal on it, and then find somebody with black hair, rotate it seven times, find a black dog, and find a black button, and do this. And the world is doing it. Folks, why am I sharing this with you? Let me ask you. If it is so easy to get shani in, shani out, shani in, shani out, shani in, shani out, help me, why don't we send shani to Pakistan, destroy all the terrorists? If it is so easy to get Shani in, Shani out, Shani in, Shani out, why don't we send Shani to Ladakh to fight the Chinese? I have a question to you people. Why doesn't Shani ever go to Australia? Why doesn't Shani ever go to New Zealand? Why is he permanently sitting here? Folks, I say this because if you read the life history of Swami Vivekananda, Swami Dayanand, Guru Nanak, they never believed in all these things. In fact, they fought against it. They fought against it. Folks, go check out Guru Nanak's life. He fought against it. And all Sikh families, they have no, they never tell you horoscopes. There is no Manglik. There is no Shubh Mahurat. Every Sikh wedding is done on a Sunday. Sunday doesn't sit right, they do it on a Saturday. Saturday doesn't sit right, they do it on a Friday. Folks, I share with you this article. It says superstition. Folks, remember, faith gives strength. But blind faith leading to superstition weakens people. This article is from India today. It is January 2018. And it says, because of astrology and superstition, natural childbirth in many parts of India has gone down by 80%. 80%. Especially the coded South India, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Madras. They said, you can Google and check it out, 80% of childbirth there is done through C-section operation. You know why? Some astrologers said, this is good old man, pull out the kid at this time. 80% of childbirth is done through C-section because of this. What is going on here? Every Saturday, all you find is at the traffic light, there are seven Mirchi and one Nimbu. Get rid of Shani here. And very crucial thing I'm talking about is that today people, the cat has crossed the road. Folks, I and I share this because for a very important reason. Folks, we all have ups and downs in life. Yes, no. I see a face, few faces come up here. Dr. Kavita, we all have ups and downs. Yes, no. Yes. Okay. Life is not always going up. We all and life is a roller coaster. We go up and down. And when we have a down. A person who's getting somewhere in life that analyzes the situation, learn from it, don't repeat the mistake, they accept responsibility. But a person is not looking to get anywhere in life. He says, it is not my fault, my stars are not favoring me. They never accept responsibility and they say this is bad luck. And they keep repeating the same mistake again and again and again and again. Folks, I think my 
Time is getting close to being up. How much time do I have left? Hello? I just want to close this with, do I have another three more minutes, four minutes? Hello? Mr. Heyman, do I have four more minutes? I just want to close. Yeah, please, okay. Sure. Okay. You see, I just want to close this with one last thing, and that is, I was going to the airport once, and uh, the driver hit the brakes so hard, the car came to a screeching halt. So I asked him, what happened? He said, sir, Billy Rasta cut me. Billy Rasta cut me. So I asked him, ki, bhaiya, ab kya hoga? Kaita sahab, ab mein gaari rok deta hoon, ab shagun hai, kyunki agar jayenge, to kuch nuksan ho jayega. I said, if my, I miss my flight, to bhoat nuksan ho jayega. So I asked him, ki, bhaiya, kab tak gaari rok hoge? Kaita sahab, jab tak koi dousra nikal nahi jaye. I said, phir uska nuksan ho jayega. He said, that's his problem. This guy had the answer to everything. But then I asked him a second question. I said, supposing you were 25 yards behind and supposing the cat had crossed the street and supposing you had not seen the cat. In that case, you would have just gone ahead straight and you would have been the first car. In that case, what, in that case, what would have happened? You know what his answer was? He said, in that case, Billy ki power kam ho jati hai, sahab. Billy ki power kam ho jati hai. What a joke. Sahab, aap has rahe hain. Jaante ho, padhe likhe PhD, MBA yehi kuch kar rahe hain today. Remember, faith gives strength, but blind faith leading to superstition weakens people. And there are people who go to the so-called God man today, touch their feet. The guy should be in jail. And people run to them and they say, Baba Ji, kya kare? One Baba says, Beta, preet karo, preet karo, preet karo. One Baba is selling preet, another Baba is selling honey, another Baba is mixing honey preet together and selling there today. Folks, all I can say is, use faith as a strength-giving tool. Blind faith leading to superstition weakens people. And lastly, I want to conclude this with that this is time to give back. We are grateful to God. God has blessed us with good food, honorable living, but there are many people who don't have that. It is time for us to share. And I have seen videos from New York, Europe, everywhere all over the world. There are people coming forward to help underprivileged and they're coming up with time and money and food, all kinds of things. But there is one community, there is one community who has been honored all over the world. Heaven sir, this one community has been honored all over the world for the humanitarian service. And they've been honored by the government of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, United States. This community has been honored all over the world for the humanitarian service. And that community is, guess what? The Sikh community of India. The Sikh community has been honored everywhere. And we're proud of it. You know why the concept of sharing is not new to them. 500 years ago, Guru Nanak started the concept of langar. And today, millions of people are eating langar there. Because the Sikh philosophy believes in three things. They're caring people, they're sharing people, and they're daring people. I repeat, they're caring people, they care. They're sharing people, they share. And they're daring people, they dare. They have the guts and courage to fight also. You know why? Because the Guru Granth Sahib and the philosophy, Sikh philosophy believes in three pillars. Nam Jap, one Chak, Kiratkar. Nam Jap is formless God, one God. One Chak is a concept of sharing. And the Let me finish. So now you can see her. You see, see the Zoom, then you can see uh, Madhumati also. Can, can you just let me finish, please? Okay. And the third concept yeah, third is, the pillar, the third is the pillar of Kiratkar. I just want to ask these panelists here, have you ever seen a Sikh gentleman begging anywhere in the world? You will never find a Sikh as a beggar. You know why the philosophy of Guru Granth Sahib is very clear. 
they work hard, honestly, and nothing is too small, dignity of labor. They don't mind cleaning the bathroom, they don't mind cleaning the toilets, but they will not go begging. And the best part is, in the six, there is no cost. There is no cost. Every sick man is a sing, and his, every sick woman is a core. And I wish in India, if we had adopted the principles of the Sikh philosophy in this country, instead of one constitution, this country would have been totally a different country. Folks, with those words, I want to hand over the mic back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kera. That was wonderfully illuminating. And uh, since we are running out of time, otherwise we would have wanted this session to continue further. Thank you once again. And now we have Sri Hemant Kanoria, and uh, Hemantji would now be addressing uh, and talking to us about the huge experience that he has had, having been instrumental in uh, presenting this World Confluence from 2010 onwards. Please welcome Sri Hemant Kanoria. A very warm welcome to all the eminent speakers, delegates, participants who are attending today the uh, World Confluence of Humanity, Power and Spirituality. This is the 13th of series, uh, the annual series that we have, the 13th year. Unfortunately or fortunately, this is the first year which is being done virtually because before this, it was always physical meeting. We had thousands of people coming in. We had uh, you know, many eminent speakers from all, of, all over the world, from all religions, all disciplines, who were coming and attending this particular program, participating with each other, meeting each other, interacting. So this time it is very, very different because when you meet people, when you interact with them, when you network with them to understand things because small snippets, little words they really help us and it remains back but this is lost but this is the new world that we are in the virtual world so welcome a very warm welcome to all of you and i think that uh, you know this i don't uh, i hope that next year we will have the physical meeting and it is not going to be the virtual meeting again but nevertheless the virtual meeting has its advantages because when we have the physical meetings, many people all over the world who want to attend, they are not in a position to do so. Few people are able to make it to Calcutta or Delhi whenever we have had it in these particular locations. But in the virtual world, people can attend from all over the world, anywhere. And so today we have thousands of people who are connected, who are hearing us, who are going to participate, who are participating in this particular conference. So the conference is becoming more and more prominent now. And especially in these times when we have seen the pandemic and first time the world has been hit with this kind of a mammoth pandemic after 100 years. So I don't think so. Any one of us, we have seen the last pandemic because all of us would be younger than 100 years, which was in 1918 earlier. So this is a very different experience for all of us. And if I go through this particular experience and try to see that how do we dovetail it with the spirituality, humanity and power that we are trying to have everyone participate today and what are the thoughts that they should be taking away. Because with the pandemic, people initially got very scared because they did not know that where this invisible virus, which is so fatal, so lethal, it is more lethal than missiles and military weapons because from where it will hit whom, no one had any idea about it. So there was a scare all over the world and globally, all the leaders, they declared lockdowns, which was almost like curfews everywhere, that people were not even allowed to move out, meet each other, because no one knew that who would get affected with this virus and no one could see it. With that scare, people went home, they did not know whether it is going to hit them. Then gradually when people were staying home, it also dislocated them. Businesses were disrupted, lives were disrupted. Initially also many people felt happy because they were able to spend so much of time with their family. But gradually the family got 
fed up of each other because when you stay too much with each other then you start getting fed up of each other because you think it's too much and that's the normal human behavior because if you like something if you have one cake and if you have to have 10 pieces of cake at the same time it is the diminishing return theory which plays a very important role so that's what started happening then people started first of all splurging eating a lot you know really entertaining themselves but gradually they found that it was getting boring and so therefore people started seeing that you know this covid can hit them and people started internalizing and started looking at themselves because the doctors said that the vaccination is not there so the only way that you can help yourself is by developing your own immune system if your immune system is strong so people started having all the kalas and all the herbal teas and everything which was to do health i think that turmeric was something which people were trying to just dose off turmeric like water so that they could build up their immune system it does not happen in one day but everyone started looking at themselves so the learning was that people started going intern and that is what all spirituality is about the spirituality power humanity all these elements are within us we don't realize it many times because in the hurry of life in so many things that we got get occupied with family with friends with work with profession that we just forget about looking at ourselves we don't go within ourselves and many people were not even able to come out of their houses so therefore they were not able to even exercise once they realized after 2 3 weeks that exercise was important they were not able to exercise and that is where i go back to our own history of our country that the teachings which we have from the rishis that how the rishis used to be in their hermitage for long long periods of time they used to sit under the tree and meditate and that is how yoga was invented yoga the unison of body mind and soul and therefore what the yoga taught was postures which were which were the asanas which the rishis used to do because they were sitting at one place or in the hermitage so which made them to exercise which was important and therefore we have different postures in yoga which is the asanas then you have pranayam which was for the mind that how do you calm your mind and have better control on the breathing again this was important because the doctors said that if you want to improve your immunity system and if you want to see that you are not affected with covid so you must exercise you must do pranayam so your lungs are better you have better control on your mind and the third stage was the sadhana which is meditation contemplation and that is all which was very important because contemplation again makes us go into ourselves and look at ourselves and reflect that what are where do we need to do improvements where we are at what stage of life in our journey because life is a journey so where we where do we stand in our journey whether we have crossed 10 milestones 100 milestones 15 50 uh, 1500 milestones how many milestones we have crossed and how many milestones we have to cross further going onwards in life and as our philosophy very well defines that this journey which we have is not a one lifetime so maybe a person may be living for even 100 years but the journey is not over because our soul's journey continues forever and ever and we do not know when it began we do not know where it is going to end and when it is going to end so this is what life is all about and that is what our philosophy teaches us and spirituality is just that discovery getting into the journey many people think that spirituality is about religion religion are just practices which basically helps there are some lot of rituals which are there in almost all the religions these are different paths to reach the same god or even i think that it is the beauty of our philosophy and especially the indian philosophy the vedic or the hindu philosophy which we are in a position to understand that it does not say that there is god or there is no god it only talks about our own self our own discovering ourselves our own self journey is 
what is fully articulated and expressed by all the philosophers, the scientists, the rishis who used to be philosophers and scientists, and basically uh, they were in a position to, from their own experience, they were in a position to explain this aspect of life, which was which is spirituality. So I think that you know we are, and especially in India and many parts of the world now, I see that everyone has been able to in these nine months of lockdowns opening up again lockdowns partial lockdowns and in some of the countries we have second phase third phase of covid which is going on we know that the vac vaccination is on but for everyone to get the vaccination and everyone to realize the benefits of the vaccination is also going to be a journey in itself so vaccination is not the solution vaccination is definitely going to help us the solution is that how do we improve our own immune system? What are the right things that we do for our body, for our mind and soul? The spirituality aspect is very important because when we are locked down, when we are with the families, even today I see my children, my grandchildren, they, you know, they have a big problem because they are not able to go to their schools. They have to study virtually. It's a very different experience because humans are not made to be locked up in a room and do work. Humans are, as we say, we are social animals. So as social animals, we need to interact with each other. Even the children, because with interactions, we understand different aspects of people, different aspects of life, of each other. We learn, we teach, we make mistakes, and that is a journey of life. But unfortunately, because of the physical contacts, which is not there, we are missing on it. But I think that, you know, everything has a lesson. We should not get disappointed. So this must be the lesson for the whole world to just take a pause, to see that what they have to do internally to develop themselves. So I think that this is the right time for everyone. And I'm sure that everyone has been focusing on developing their body, mind and soul. I see most of the people have become healthier. They have lost a lot of weight. I used to always wonder that, you know, how sitting at home people can lose weight. But I see that, you know, people lose five between five kgs to 20 kgs of weight because everyone has started realizing that if they are obese, then they can be attacked by the COVID. So COVID has been a good thing for the world because it has helped us to pause, to look at ourselves, to develop ourselves, to develop our body, mind and soul. And that is what our philosophy the Vedic or the Hindu philosophy talks about that how do we internalize and how do we spiritually get onto the right path. Many people have been started, have started reading books where we have uh, all the thoughts which has been defined by the Rishis and great people who have had their own experiences, their journeys, which they share. But all the gurus and the sages I've seen they have explained it very well that the experience which they share is their own experience. They never are dogmatic to tell a person that this is what you should be doing or not doing. They share their experience and say that our experiences is our journey. So we can learn from those experiences. We may not learn from the experiences. That is our choice. If you do not want to learn from those experiences, it is up to us. But if you want to learn from those experiences, it is going to be good from, for us, but we have to have our own experience. There is no dogmatism, which is there in the philosophy, which we most of us, we believe in, which is the, in the Hindu or the Vedic philosophy as we talk about. And that is why more and more people are accepting this philosophy because it does not limit anyone. It does not define any boundaries. It says that the whole cosmos and is just huge. Get into the journey of the cosmos. Experience the universe. Experience your own self, and which is unending, which is infinite, because there is no difference between us and God, because God is within us. And if God is within, within us, our experience, if you want to experience God, we need to first of all experience ourselves. And that journey of our experiencing ourselves is the journey to true search of God. And that is what our uh, philosophy defines it very well. I'm sure that, you know, 
today and tomorrow we are going to have very fruitful engagements discussion discourses with from eminent speakers and uh, you know i must express my gratitude to all the eminent speakers who have got together and all the participants i'm sure that this uh, journey of our lives will continue it should be and i wish everyone a lot of safety good health and because christmas is just next week so merry christmas and a very very happy new year, new year to everyone thank you madhuvant you are on mute madhuvant you are on mute you have to unmute okay yeah madhuvant again you have gone on mute sorry madhuvant you are still on mute can you mute can someone you mute someone so that can you hear me right thank thank you so much uh, once again for speaking beautifully and reminding us uh, of the age old tenets of our philosophy the journey within and internalization uh, before i invite our next speaker we would just like to say that there are quite a few thousand people watching us uh, watching the first day of the world confluence and uh, in fact our platform has a message option so whatever question you might have please do send your questions via the chat box the message option that you had uh, in our platform and right now we are all absolutely dying to hear one of the great celebrities of our country padma shri shrimati anuradha podwal singer extraordinary musician extraordinary mainly uh, someone who had uh, allowed us to enjoy her wonderful music through the various popular songs in bollywood although her virtuosity is limitless she can sing any kind of songs but perhaps some of us have identified very very closely very very intensely with her spiritual songs her bhajans and all the spiritual uh, songs that she has specialized in uh anuradha ji welcome and we have another beautiful lady with you whom i'm sure you are going to introduce welcome to our platform and we would love to hear you thank you so much namaste can you hear me yes okay ah uh, namaste babu ji uh, thank you for making me a part of this wonderful uh, conference the virtual conference uh, online conference and uh, thank you rahul ji um uh, well uh, i think heman ji has pretty much taken the words out of our mouth and he has voiced so many of our thoughts uh, spirituality is of course the base of our sanatan dharma and uh, it is that which uh, keeps us grounded in all the situations pandemic or any other difficulties also it is uh, sadly uh, we see a lot of people you know uh, mixing up with spirituality and religion uh, well i feel that uh, no matter what the what the religion spirituality is the base of any religion or it should be i've been uh, extremely fortunate uh, to uh, have a family who is extremely uh, religious and spiritual by nature my both my children aditya and kavita uh, kavita whom i'm going to be uh, soon going to introduce her and uh, she is taken up the same path uh, i would say the pandemic uh, has taught us uh, two very important things uh, one is how important it is to have a joint family and having said that you know it's it's like a buffer you you have the family to fall back upon in 
all sorts of crises all sorts of difficult times but at the same time uh, this pandemic has taught us a very very important thing that is how to live with yourself and i think that is the most difficult thing to live with yourself because you are you have only yourself to answer so these are the things uh, i feel and um, of course uh, with all these uh, temples uh, being closed you know it has uh, probably the gods have taught us that spirituality is not restricted to a particular religion so uh, it has also taught us to see the humanity and the spirituality in the doctors and the nurses and all those people in the public services who were helping us out regardless of what caste or creed we belong to another thing it has taught us that it's extremely you know we had started abusing all the wealth or all the position that we have and it is extremely necessary for us to uh, live in moderation however high we go or however low so it has uh, really really made us uh, very contemplative and i would like to introduce uh, you to my daughter kavita and i i would really uh, take this opportunity to say i am extremely blessed to have a daughter like her because uh, she has been the, in the us for the last 5 uh, years that is 15 years back and she worked in the un and uh, the way she has conducted herself and in spite of uh, of having li uh, lived in a western country that has not changed in the way she looks at spirituality so she is a great uh, pillar of strength for me and i would like to introduce uh, to you kavita podwal tulpure who also has her dream and it's a conviction that she would like to uh, get the culture of yog other than yoga the yog and uh, the, introducing it as a curriculum in uh, the colleges abroad of course if allowed in india also but uh, sometimes i feel it's much easier there and i want you to bless her and i wish her all the luck thank you very much kavita paudwal tulpore thank you ma namaskar everybody i hope uh, you all can hear me can you hear me yes yes okay thank you very much again that was that was that was such a wonderful introduction probably uh, i don't deserve that much but yes i have been blessed in plenty full because i have been i have a mother who is in place of my guru and uh, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to represent uh, surodaya foundation also which is a social initiative undertaken by anuradha ji uh, i will be talking a little bit about it and uh, yes but today and i was told that uh, you know we had to be talking about uh, spirituality and music because you know there's an immediate association of anuradha ji and thodi bahut meri bhi you know association music se hi bani hui hai but uh, i think jin logon ne anuradha ji ke bhajan sune hain ya unke gaaye hue shlok sune hain unhe uh, कोई एक्सप्लेनेशन देने की जरूरत ही नहीं है जो अनुभूति उन्हें आती है उन उन शब्दों को सुनकर जो भाव उनमें उमड़ आते हैं उन भजनों को सुनकर आई थिंक दैट्स ऑल दैट इज व्हाट स्पिरिचुअलिटी एंड म्यूजिक इज आई रियली डोंट थिंक आई नीड टू एक्सप्लेन दैट फॉर दो बट यस आई विल बी टेकिंग दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड दिस वंडरफुल प्लेटफॉर्म विथ ऑल ऑफ यू पीपल हु आर सो इवॉल्व हु आर सो सक्सेसफुल एंड हु आर सो अवेयर ऑफ द नीड of our spirituality in our lives in our country in this world uh, you know i would like to talk about something uh, called active spirituality like all of you have mentioned before anuradha ji ne bhi bataya hai ki kai baar hum log religion aur spirituality mein confuse ho jate hain every religion is basically a set of rules a set of procedures practices which we have followed over a period of time and every religion ka jo uh, end point hai that is to reach divinity but what i have realized is that people tend to 
caught up and people tend to get lost in those processes you know uh log of course of course there is an upside to it because you know your the families are getting together people are getting together uh, in a very positive kind of an atmosphere so it's wonderful but that's not the be all and the end all of it aur ye baat sirf wahi log samajh sakte hain jo ishwar se prem karte hain i think religion will lead only those people to spirituality who are in love with god ya parmatma ishwar aap jo bhi unhe kahe so today i would like to talk about something that is outside of religion outside of spirituality it is something called active spirituality so why is it today that you know when when humans have evolved so much you know we are able to reach pretty much uh, you know whatever planet we are able to communicate science and technology is all over the place we are able to clone human beings we are able to clone animals we are able we are trying to get to a place where you can regrow limbs and when when there's so much happening why the need for spirituality so i'm going to take an example of three different kinds of people because generally when uh, you know when i was in the us and i would have these conversations with my friends about uh, you know what the indian philosophy is yeah what sanatan is about तो वो कहते थे अच्छा सो हाउ कम इट्स ओनली पीपल इन इंडिया हु नीड ऑल ऑफ दिस यू नो देर आर पीपल इन द यू एस एंड देर आर पीपल इन यूरोप एंड हाउ कैम दे सर्वाइव वेरी वेल विदाउट विदाउट फिलोसफी विच इज वाई आई एम पर्टिकुलरली टेकिंग यू नो दीज थ्री एग्जाम्पल्स सो द फर्स्ट एग्जाम्पल वुड बी ऑफ अ स्टूडेंट ओके अ स्टूडेंट प्रॉबली बिकॉज अ लॉट ऑफ इंडियन चिल्ड्रन ऑल्सो टूडे स्टडी इन आई वी लीग स्कूल यू नो दे गो देर इवन फॉर अंडर ग्रैड दे गो ग्रैड स्कूल तो है ही बट अंडर ग्रैड के लिए भी वहां पर जाते हैं so why would a child uh, you know who is going to an ivy league school why would he require spirituality it seems like everything is pretty much set up for him what he would uh, what he would probably require is a career trajectory okay he would need to get into a good organization which will take him places falana falana to ye hua ek part then i go to the complete other end of of the spectrum which is aapko pata hi hai ki kuch saalon pehle this is horrible horrible uh, thing where farmers you know were taking up their own lives because they were unable to pay off loans as little as 50000 1 lakh you know unko spirituality ki kya zarurat hai you know logically speaking they needed the money to pay off their loans so they could get on with life and pray for better rainfall next year what about the children of those farmers unko spirituality ki kya zarurat thi they needed to have their parents alive they needed food they needed education so they don't have to go through the same troubles that their parents went through so ek ye hua aur beech wala jo section hai which i think is people like you and me it's unfortunate because sometimes the biggest problem in our day is how to get from point a to point point b without getting into a traffic jam <laughs> it's sad but sometimes that becomes the biggest you know that, that becomes the high point of the day or oh my god i have lost network now what do i do so where, where you know in sab mein spirituality kahan par aata hai is it is it can we say ke in sab ka solution spirituality mein hai i don't know let's find out so uh according to me according to me spirituality is like nature now this is something that my mom had pointed out to me while while saying something else but today when i sat and you know i thought i should be talking about a few things what i realized is this the spirituality that we really need to reach out to is like nature why nature because nature intrinsically does not change okay we are not talking about climate change weather change nature basically jo hai wahi hai karodo varsho se jaisa hai waise hai evolve ho raha hai but it has not changed another thing is nature does not give knee jerk reactions nature never reacts nature gracefully responds what does nature respond to nature responds to your and my actions okay if there is global warming happening today it is because of you know human activity agar 6 8 mahine lockdown hone ke baad agar raste par mor nach rahe the to wo bhi human activity kam hone se hi hai so this is nature's you know nature is not the sort jaise uh, kal ko agar meri beti mujhe aakar kehti hai mom I, i i want to go out with my friends and i say no nature doesn't do that nature doesn't do a knee jerk reaction okay nature responds very peacefully i feel that is what spirituality is hum aur aap aur har living organism ke andar 
वो एक ऐसी चीज है यू नो जो बहुत स्थिर है ओके इट डज नॉट इंट्रेंसिकली चेंज इट रिमेन्स द सेम एंड इट नेवर रिएक्ट इट रिस्पॉन्स I feel that if we are able to reach out to that part of us, okay, which is able to actually take a minute, not give a knee-jerk reaction, not give an emotional outburst to every situation, or not give an emotional outburst to the person sitting next to you, I think that is the kind of spirituality that we need. That is the kind of unchanging, intrinsic. यू नो जो हमारे अंदर है हमें उसे ढूंढना है ऑल्सो आई फील दैट दिस सो ये ये हुआ रिलीजन ये हुआ स्पिरिचुअलिटी नाउ वी कम टू समथिंग कॉल्ड एक्टिव स्पिरिचुअलिटी विच एक्चुअली इज द नीड ऑफ द डे एक्टिव स्पिरिचुअलिटी इज दैट वेन ईच ऑफ अस डिस्कवर्स दैट कॉमन अनचेंजिंग एलिमेंट विद इन अस इट इज ओनली अ पार्ट ऑफ अ हायर एलिमेंट यू नो जिसे हम परमेश्वर कहते हैं जिसे हम परमात्मा कहते हैं उस आत्मा का हम भाग हैं और जिस दिन हर एक इंसान को अपने अंदर की आत्मा में परमात्मा दिखने लगा दैट इज द टाइम ही कनेक्ट्स टू दैट कॉन्शियसनेस एंड इट इज दैट कॉन्शियसनेस दैट हेल्प्स ईच वन ऑफ अस डू द राइट थिंग एट द राइट टाइम गिव द राइट रिएक्शन रिसीव द राइट काइंड ऑफ हेल्प फ्रॉम द राइट काइंड ऑफ पीपल सो आई फील अगेन कमिंग बैक टू दोज थ्री एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स एंड ऑफ द फार्मर्स एंड ऑफ यू एंड मी probably if the student early on in life is able to connect with his intrinsic unchanging nature maybe aage ja kar he will take a job okay which will not only help him get on the cover of a time magazine but it will also help him change the lives of people and this is something that happens when only when that command comes from the higher consciousness probably the same higher consciousness will stop that farmer from taking that knee jerk extreme step the same higher consciousness will will reach out to uh, you know the conscience of a business person who will help this farmer pay off his loan or reach out to the consciousness of people who run institutions who can help with water please don't misunderstand i am not undermining uh, you know the farmers plight i am not using it as you know an example just to further my cause or to talk about here i know it is it is a very big problem and but i just feel that sometimes it is that one split second that stops you from doing the right or the wrong thing and ye jo buddhi humme aati hai to actually think about what is right and wrong it happens only when you take a minute and you connect to your inner self and i feel you know the universal conscience which tells your conscience to stop and think okay so and i feel this active spirituality is dharm isi ko dharm kehte hain कि आपको कब कौन सी चीज kitni matra mein karni hai kiske sath karni hai kyon karni hai ये जो रियलाइजेशन है यही तो धर्म है और यही हमारा सनातन धर्म है दिस इज वॉट रिलीजन हैज ट्राइड टू टीच एस बट जैसे ब्यूटिफुल सेइंग बाय रजनीश ओशो कि मैं तुम्हें चांद दिखा रहा हूँ और तुम केवल मेरी उंगली देख रहे हो सो वेयर वी एक्चुअली नीड टू रीच इज समथिंग एल्स एंड वी कैन रीच बाई टेकिंग बेबी स्टेप्स वो स्टेप्स लेने में जो हमें हेल्प करेगा वो है हमारा अपना कॉन्शियंस so this is active spirituality which is the need of the hour also something that we know as dharm something that each one of us need to do as a part of this collective universe so i will uh, just sum up i will sum up all of this uh, with uh, two three small examples one is uh, yes very much like my mother said i feel that you know the ability to connect with the self and the ability to make yourself responsible for everything that is happening around you in a good way i'm not saying uh, you know meri wajah se ye galat hua nahi main ise sahi kar sakta hu ye jo sochne ki kshamta hai this is something that should be taught to us when we are very young you know not yes, very much like my fortunate sorry to connect not everyone is possible to have uh, this i'm sorry somebody has unmuted themselves yeah right so i'm 
I'm, I'm towards the end of uh, what I'm about to say. Uh, the reason I feel that yoga, Bhagavad Gita, when, when I mean yoga, I don't mean only asanas. I mean the entire philosophy of yoga, the, the ability to live right, the ability to be an optimal person is something that should be introduced in schools all over the world. Because I feel a child who grows up, जिसे आदत हो जाती है बचपन से कि नहीं कोई चीज नी जर्क रिएक्शन नहीं करनी सोच समझ के करनी है he will automatically grow into a healthy adult, into a happy adult. And I'm not saying that all of this will end up like, uh, you know, a Suraj Bajatya movie or an Annie Blyton book, though I, I love both of them and I appreciate their ability to see the good in everything. But even if one of us can make the change and affect two people and those two people can affect another four people. I think we've at least started somewhere. And I think, you know, the uh, this entire the pandemic situation and COVID has, has made it very clear that I think humanity has united in its policy. Humanity has united because, because they've realized that we are not invincible. You know, we can do a lot of things, but, you know, if, if nature cracks a whip, it's you know, you come down to basics where you need to do nothing but just stay, stay put. So I think we should really use this opportunity to look within ourselves and not only ourselves, teach these, this, these things to our children because they are the ones and they are far more receptible than people who, are, who have already been conditioned with ideas, which is why I feel it's very important to introduce these philosophies at school levels and children should be made to practice you need to come and tell me how you have helped a person in this week what good have you done for a person another thing uh, you know about about the family about being with the family they need to be graded for these things they need to be told what have you done to your mother today or what have you done for your father today come and tell me you know, okay. it's these things and it will just become a way of life something that has been taught to us through scriptures will become a way of life anyway so I think uh, once again thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity for this amazing platform I'm eternally grateful to my mother for just being my mother and, and giving me everything uh, you know that I had ever imagined asked for and also this friend of mine where uh, you know where I want to appreciate everything that has been given to me uh, once again thank you so much thank you so much Kavita ji Anuradha ji thank you so much you. for thank being with much. us um, we just have a, you know, we have thousands of people watching this and we have had some questions from them. So um, with your permission, I would like to share one of them. Many people have uh, particularly wanted to know that uh, you, have, uh, you have a special affinity for singing spiritual songs and yes. while singing a bhajan or any other kind of spiritual song, have you had a particular spiritual experience while singing it? Uh, well, uh, from my childhood, I was always, uh, you know, I was uh, spiritual by nature. Uh, my family, it was a very small family. We were not very, uh, my uh, parents were not very religious, but we were very spiritual. They were very spiritual. And uh, I grew up, uh, in that way and uh, I it may be uh, it may seem very uh, strange but I never had a uh, affinity for the film, li film line mm -hmm. as such but once I got in yes absolutely because mm -hmm. I entered the film line also with the Shiv Stuti then uh, mm -hmm. I sang a lot of songs uh, for about 12 years and uh, after that I was uh, a little bit restless and I happened to go to Dakshineshwar temple. Babuji knows that because right. he's also mm -hmm. a, a devotee of uh, Makali. And uh, mm -hmm. the Pandit ji said, you know, ki Anuradha ek ka bhajan gao. And I was in tears because I realized that in the 12 long years that she had given me so much success and so many songs, not a single uh, bhajan was uh, dedicated to her. I had not sung a single bhajan. 
and yeah. i was in tears or in that spurt of that that particular moment you know i just asked i said ma bless me i'm so sorry i ha- i should have done this long back but please bless me mere se itni tumhari stuti gawa lena ki matlab hinduon ke jitne mandir hai us har mandir ke sath mera chehra aur naam jod dena this is something mm-hmm. that i just you know on the spur of the moment and it actually happened that Uh, starting from um, durga saptashati i went on mm. to sing and then i i had this is what i had told ma i said krishna not that i am very uh, very fond of uh, the film industry but i don't want to get out of the film industry you know when i'm not singing so many songs or where i'm not that successful but the day i'm number one in film industry mai khud apne haathon se tumhare charno pe chhod dungi you know and then of course I started getting those. I uh, I was in a company uh, T series. आप जानते हैं जो north में जिनका मंदिरों के साथ इतना ज़्यादा उनका लगाव था और इतना ज़्यादा connection था and the videos in house videos होते थे. So we uh, बहुत ज़्यादा हम लोगों ने uh, recordings किए. And uh, the one thing I want to tell you that. there are not one or two there are innumerable incidents that uh, i experienced while i was recording all this i mean it 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 just became my dna you know so anything whenever i even today whenever i go and sit on a stage you know it's like just jaise hum प्लग इन करते हैं वैसे यू नो आई जस्ट कनेक्ट टू मा दिस इज आई थिंक दिस इज माय गुरुज एंड हर स्पेशल ब्लेसिंग्स फॉर मी टू कनेक्ट लाइक दैट बिकॉज़ आई हैव गोन टू अ लॉट ऑफ अप्स एंड डाउन्स माय लाइफ हैज बीन लाइक अ रोलर कोस्टर राइड रोलर कोस्टर एब्सोल्युटली रोलर कोस्टर एंड एट द एंड ऑफ इट आई कैन से दैट इफ आई एम टुडे इन वन पीस it's only thanks to the spirituality she has hmm. taken care of everything baki to there are there are so many things you know uh, uh, bahut sare anubhav bahut zyada anubhav aaye hain which i think yahan pe discuss karna karne ke liye time bahut uh, kam hai kam is liye hai because there are so many other speakers also but uh, right. yes definitely kyunki um, matlab you can't be away from these experiences when you are uh, in front of the lord thank you so much thank you for sharing you so much. candidly with us and uh, so of course the blessings will always be with you kavita ji thank you so much thank you um, thank you for having right so next we move on to dr kamlesh patel dr patel is already waiting for us and uh, as we know that he is a very well known spiritual leader and author uh, of heartfulness dr patel is a vital role model for anyone wanting to evolve as a human being and expand consciousness and uh, he is a spiritual catalyst who is able to connect with people from all walks of life there are endless things to talk about dr kamlesh patel but as anuradha ji just said that time is short uh, plus we can we would like to save a little bit of time at the end for question answer sessions because thousands of people who are watching this from different parts of the world they have questions uh, they are hearing your speeches very very minutely so we'd like to uh, you know reserve some time for that so dr patel we welcome you to this platform and we await your speech so we begin all right namaskar everyone my respected elders brothers and sisters across the world namaste namaste and very joyful greetings to all i never heard something like this confluence of humanity power and spirituality wonderful so it's truly a pleasure for me to share 
my keynote address at the 13th World Confluence of Humanity, Power and Spirituality, organized by Sri Foundation. So I would like to begin by first expressing my gratitude, heartfelt gratitude to Sri Hari Prasad Kanoriyaji, Chairman Universal Spirituality and Humanity Foundation, and Chairman Sri Foundation. Also, gratitude to Sri Heman Kanoriyaji, Chairman of Sri Infrastructure and Finance Limited, Board of Trustees of Kanoria Foundation, and Dr. Rahul Verma, the Director of World Confluence of Humanity, Power and Spirituality, for having invited me to deliver this keynote address at this very August event. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. The subject that was given to me to expound is on destiny versus freedom of choice. I, would, I had an opportunity of listening to two August Padwal family members, perhaps I don't know if Kavita and Anuradha are related, I wonder, but they had good insight, and I appreciate striking difference. Anuradha was trying to differentiate between religion and spirituality. She boldly says, my family was not religious per se, but we were spiritual. Most religious people, they end up believing in destiny. They go from one astrologer to another astrologer from one temple to another temple, from one religious guru to another religious guru, and try to see what is in their destiny. And hopefully by evoking the presence of higher almighty, change their destiny once and for all so that they can live happily ever after. Is it possible? So we're gonna dissect this. What is destiny after all? If destiny was fixed, then why am I struggling, working so hard? Or if I'm suffering so much, why am I struggling to get out of this struggle in order to free myself from pain and misery? If I had to earn billions, why am I struggling to work hard? If all these things was fixed in my destiny, I like to share with you one episode from Ramayana, which is well known, but nevertheless, it is worth mentioning here since it has all the significance that destiny is not everything. Either I can change my destiny with my own hard work by changing my attitude, my thoughts, my orientation to the whole life they all can change my destiny or others can influence my destiny. Rama and story is very relevant here. You know, Rishi Vasistha is one of the Sapta Rishis. They have insight and foresight. He was the one who matched the zodiacs of Lord Rama and Mother Sita. He said, this is a perfect pair. Nothing can go wrong with this marriage. Raja Dasarath was happy to hear this. And on good opportune event, he fixed the wedding of Lord Rama with Mother Sita. Great. And you have seen how this destiny that was predicted by Vasist, Sage Vasist, that they will live happily. It's a perfect match. But anything and everything that can go wrong with in the life of such a divine couple, Mother Sita, who was a divinity incarnated, how can she suffer despite of this predicted destiny? Something changed. Their attitudes were perfect. Their lifestyle was ideal. 
matchless. Even till today, no one can match their ideals and moral strength or moral power. Yet they suffered like nobody. What was the cause? What changed the destiny? It was no less a person than Mother Kai Kai. She ended up changing the whole scenario. You all know the story, what transpired there. So there are influences which are beyond our control. Either your father will change your destiny, or your mother will change your destiny, or your loved ones. Often the loved ones can influence so much that your life either blooms like a beautiful flower or destroyed and crushed under elephant's legs. I'll give you one more example. Suppose you fall in love with someone, you love that person so much, but because of your caste system or etc., or class system, or because of whatever reason your parents or her parents reject this relationship, then what will happen? There is a chain reaction of misery. Person you love, whom you could not marry, will suffer. You will suffer. Person whom you marry will suffer. Person she marries will suffer. And there is a chain reaction of misery after misery. So who is deciding this dynamic nature of destiny? All of us. I am not the only one who is deciding my destiny, but other members whom we love so much, whom we listen. Of course, it's one way of saying to hell with this. I'm not going to listen to my father if he says I should not marry the one I love. But that also creates a level of misery. Not listening to father will create guilt in your heart. So then it comes to making such decisions. One has to be very careful, very, very careful, not just you, but all, all family members involved in this very important thing has to come together, resonate. And this is possible when everyone is on the same page. But is it possible? In this world where everyone has their opinions and differences, they say differences strengthens a family, but when? Say, I, when I'm seated with my granddaughter, when she spurts her mouth, when she does like that, or she eats the chocolate or a grain of rice, and having finished half rice in her hands, she takes it and puts it in my mouth, or she dribbles like this and starts throwing her spit on my face sometimes. What happens at that time? Had it been somebody else, I would have gotten upset. But just because she's my granddaughter, I end up going through all that. So the level of tolerance or level of acceptance depends upon how I relate myself with the other person. That other person whom I love so much dissolves any kind of friction, any kind of differences. Imagine when I come home from hard day at work. Generally, most of us return home by seven, eight o'clock. But suppose by God, God forbid, and we get stuck either in traffic or in the office. <laughs> and we end up calling dear papa or mommy or you know you end up calling your wife so i'll be late today and you have to explain everything to her then another time sorry i because of this i'm coming late and then once you start expressing the true feeling that because of this and then it gets into a kind of slowly diluted into oh I had a company which I cannot avoid, it could not avoid, and I had to take this guest out for dinner. So such last minute messages and 
every now and then where you have to express yourself to your loved ones. What do you think of that? Where every moment you have to express your loved one the reasons behind your actions. Versus, even before you say anything and your beloved says, it's okay, you don't have to explain all these things. Let's not waste time, come join me. That's an ideal relationship. Where every, at every move you have to explain yourself, your situation, that is not an ideal relationship. But where true love exists, it builds relationship. It strengthens the relationship. As they say in science, entropy. Entropy means measure of disintegration. Every system, if it is not supported by constant input, it tends to decay itself. For example, a child's room or Sister Anuradha, for example, if she is not making effort with her abhyas, abhyas is also an input of energy. If you are a master carpenter or if you are a master mason or a doctor or a very special cook, if you are not practicing this, then this input or lack of input Lack of input will spoil the talent which was inborn or that you have groomed because of your practice. So when it comes to spirituality, practice is everything. And more than a practice, how you approach the object of your love makes a difference. Attitude is more important than the practice itself. When you approach God or goddesses in the religious tradition, for example, there is always a demand from your side. Ma or my Lord, if you help me with this, I will do that. There is a transaction. There is a strong belief system that if I do this, automatically that thing will happen, right, wrong, or it's a matter of statistical evidences. It's up to you all to decide. But in spirituality, where your belief system, your, your faith is built by your own experiences, you can never go wrong. And when your faith or your belief system or your trust develop as a result of personal experience, then you are creating a strong bridge between your heart and the Lord whom you are worshipping. This worship or spiritual approach towards God is no longer restricted to five minute puja or once a year puja on the shara or once a year puja on Krishna Janmashtami or Ramanavami. No, it is not even depending upon your daily ritualistic practice, be it morning, be it evening or both. But your whole life, moment after moment, remains imbued with your heart in presence of God with presence of God. And this divinity continues to guide us all throughout the life, every moment. So meditation, though we may do, we may meditate once in the morning, but the state of meditation continues even after we have completed that 10 minutes or 15 minutes of meditation. So meditativeness remains 24 seven. What is, what is that drives an individual in meditation? Most people, including myself, I'm a big fan of 
Paramahans Ramakrishna, who influenced my life beyond one can imagine at a very early age. I used to cry like a child every night, praying to him, why did you leave so early? I mean, century back. <laughs> I wish to have a guru like you who can guide me. Vivekanand was very fortunate to have a guru like Ramakrishna Paramahansa. It used to evoke so much of sadness and inner cry in my heart. See? I don't think without this inner cry, I would have found a worthwhile spiritual path. That took me to resorting to copying Swami Vivekananda that I would sit quietly and meditate the way he used to meditate, the way he has described himself, how he used to meditate. But there was no method given in the literature. So I would just sit quietly, close my eyes and pretend as if I was meditating. God knows how many days or months I would continue practicing like this during my college days. One day a good friend of mine came up to me and says, why don't you stop wasting time with this meditation you are practicing? I'll take you to a lady. She is a preceptor of artfulness way. She'll give you a taste of samadhi. I said, why not? I'm ever willing to try anything and everything in order to experience divinity. So that's how my spiritual journey began. Because in heartfulness way, it, they use the technique of pranahuti. And it is because of this pranahuti that one is able to dive very deep and attain a state of samadhi in the very first session. It need not be a, a strong practitioner or not, it's not needed that you believe in God or you don't believe in God. It's okay. As long as you do this practice, where a preceptor or a guru will transmit to us and you feel the effect of this yogic pranahuti in our heart and that experience continues moment after moment. Again, next day morning we meditate, the experience again is intensified and the same experience will never be repeated again. Every day it will be one better than the another experience. The key thing is, I can see a different view. For example, when I am climbing on a mountain, for example, if I'm stuck at one height, compare that with one, my height of consciousness. If I'm seeing things and feeling things the same every day, that means I'm stuck at one level of consciousness. This yogic transmission or pranahuti will shift my consciousness to another higher level with each meditation, to another level of super consciousness. Also, it will help me dive deeper into my subconsciousness. So the gap between super and subconsciousness slowly widens. And because of this broadening of my consciousness, I'm able to make better decisions. Better decisions not depending upon my past. My past may help me logically to arrive at a particular decision. It can help me make a rightful decision. But my past biases, my past cognitive biases can also hinder and make and uh, unfortunately can make me make wrong decisions as well. Suppose I have prejudice against someone that she does not sing very well or she or he does not sing very well. I would never listen because of this impression that she doesn't sing well or he doesn't sing well. So this prejudice creates a problem. Similarly, in a house also, we have so many impressions about each other. 
moment we drop this precognitive biases, which are built day after day, every single moment we create these biases in our Hindu culture. We call this cognitive biases as samskaras. Swami Vivekananda used to address this as cognates. He used to say, if any particular object, when someone describes, and if that object is not familiar to you in your cognition, in your mind, then you say, these cognates are absent in my mind. But if you are familiar with it, that means similar cognates are present in your consciousness. This is because of sanskars. These samskars, we carry life after life. And as long as these samskars remain in our system, in our spiritual system, they create our destiny. If by chance, if I have the ability of removing these samskars, removing these cognates, then I will not have to undergo that particular experience. Thus, I am freeing myself from the influence of my previous karma. This is the essence of anti-Hindu philosophy. Moment one gets out of this samskara or burden of samskara, either through bhoga or through yoga, one attains liberation. If you have no samskara to go through, why would you be born again? When you have good samskaras versus when you have bad samskaras, but we are product of combination of good and bad. We are a mixture of all kinds of samskaras which we have built. Youngsters especially, they ask these days, who created these samskaras? I said, I said you created this samskar. Then they say, how did I create samskar? I said, I give you a very small example. There were many other elders, ladies and gentlemen, they were present, so I could not give them the very extraordinary example. But the example that came to me, that when you're walking through a beautiful garden, every day that's your path to office or path to your school, when you're passing through this garden, what catches your eyes on the way? So he says, oh, there is a beautiful garden and I love flowers. I say, okay. Have you ever thought of going near the flower because you like that flower so much? He said, yes, I do go. What do you do next? He said, I try to hold it with my hand. And then he said, I try to inhale fragrance. And then if nobody is looking around, I try to pluck the flower and take it home. I say, you see, from a simple process of getting attached to a simple thing like flower, you want to possess it, you want to take it home. Every action, every thought, every feeling creates such webs, not just one, but many. It would have been wonderful if one samskara that we go through and say, oh, one boga is over. No. Once you have interacted with nice flower, you'll say, wow, I would like to interact with another dozen beautiful, more fragrant flowers. There is no end to this karma. And again, resounding karma, samskaras, and again, more creation of samskaras. So we create a kind of a jail around us, complexities around us. That's why Lord Krishna talks about performing our karma in such a way that we do not form samskaras. Okay? We do not form beej, seeds for the next life or next karma. It should not become a chain reaction. Once I perform a karma, it should end there and there. It should not give birth to another or third or fourth. There should not be a chain reaction. I think Kavita was talking about this aspect that how 
we tend to create chain reactions of multi or multiple events out of one single event. One person hurt in the process, you end up hurting half a dozen more. We also collect many samskars on the way, end up creating more and more complexities around us. And that changes our destiny. Either you add samskaras to your life, that changes your destiny, or you sub subtract, remove these samskaras, then to that extent, you may not have to go through those destined or yeah. destiny that was assigned to us. So the whole practice, spiritual practice, in the words of Swami Vivekananda, if I have to put it very briefly, he says all spiritual practices he generalizes, he makes a beautiful general statement about spirituality. He says it is all about widening the available consciousness, which is like a thin film of water, which is sandwiched between two giant oceans. Allow it to grow into sky of super consciousness and allow your consciousness to merge into the giant ocean of suffering. It's a beautiful analogy he has described. It is up to us how to make our available consciousness to reach superconscious state and allow it to plunge into subconscious. It is possible only through a spiritual practice, through our rightful meditation practices. Not every meditation will lead you to removal of these cognitive biases or samskaras. Every practice, the results should become obvious to us in the very first session. If not, if not, then you got to think of some, something else. The very first encounter to a guru or to a practice. So challenge your heart and say, is this right or wrong? Even before you answer this question, your heart will say, if you find peace in the very first session, you'll say, yes, I like this. And make that path, make that way, your own path, so that our destiny can be changed and attain the final state which we all crave for. See, we, our literature, especially Gita, Gita talks about sthita prajya state. Lord Rama, when he is having a dialogue with his brother and mother Sita, that period, you know, Ramayana period was all about the discussion on consciousness. At the same time, Mother Sita's father, Raja Janak, when he's having a dialogue with Astavakra, they're talking of consciousness. Lakshman's question to his brother, they're all about consciousness. Sage Vashistha Rishi, that period he had written all about consciousness, which is today known as Vashistha Sanhita. So we had a great period, you know, where everyone, it was a fashion statement to talk about, to discuss about, to contemplate about, to meditate on aspect of consciousness. They did not worry about religious practices, like whom to worship, which temple to build. None of these were present in those days. Vedic period doesn't mention of anything of this sort. Why? One wonders why Vedas and Upanishads, our Sanadana Dharma does not mention all these things. It is because those rishis, those sages did not find a need for an external agency to help them remind of God. It's a tragedy that we have to use forms photos, Sangeet, etc., to remind us of God. If this reminder was already innate in our existence, in our self, in our heart, then this form, 
that we worship. We'll say, Akar se nirakar ki or jana hai. Then where is the need of all these things? When from I move from sabda to sunya, the sabda ki kya zarurat hai? So both the things that we depend on today in today's society, all the loudspeakers going gaga early mornings and disturbing the peaceful hours of meditation, children who have to study, all night they go on banging these loudspeakers, this song and that song. I'm not against songs, but this would be listen when you're quiet to encourage, to inspire your journey further, to, f to increase some sort of a nourishment, so to facilitate your mood so that you can dive deeper into meditation, see? So destiny is in our hands. How we change our precognitive biases faster, we will be able to change our uh, seeds of this uh, destiny maker. Finally, I would like to submit a beautiful analogy that what makes me sad and what makes me happy. When we ponder over this, when the results that we expected are favorable, we feel happy. And when they are not so favorable, we feel unhappy. It's very simple. Now, on what depends all these results? Then we think, oh, when I made my decisions with the heart, when the decision was made with my heart, that the outcome was ex as per my expectation. It was good. All my friends who are listening to me, I would request you to reflect on this that whenever you have made a bad decision, go back, what made you make such a decision? Then it will be known to you, to you immediately it will be highlighted that at that time your heart was guiding not to do it and yet you did it. So destiny making is, is a choice, freedom, that I enjoy now, freedom of making choices, will create my destiny, what I do now. And whatever I do now will depend upon how I think and kinds of attitude I have. And out of many thoughts, many possibilities, many choices I have, how will I be able to make one choice out of 10? For that, we need to meditate. And filter out all those choices. If you like, I can help you go through this process of meditation, how we meditate. And if you want to further go into details, how to remove all these complexities and impurities, which are built up over time, we call samskaras. Samskaras are nothing but these complexities and impurities we carry life after life. Mm -hmm. That needs to be filtered, that needs to be purified yeah. and simplified. Um, do we have a moment to go through this 10-15 minutes of meditation? Or you want me to continue speaking? Anyway, there is no a, answer. We can have a meditation. Okay, okay. So I urge you all to sit comfortably. I will uh, help you <laughs> with this process of meditation. I would like you to experience it rather than believing it is best to experience. Then you can say yes, that our ancient tradition of meditation is great. And uh, we all can meditate, whether you believe in this system or that system, it doesn't matter. The process here is very simple. You sit comfortably and 
first try to relax the entire physical body see and then we go to the next level of going into spiritual experience of divinity which is felt through our heart so during meditation we imagine the presence of divinity in the form of divine light so we make a sankalpa and say that this source of divine presence is in my heart and i'm meditating on it so we meditate on this idea that's all it's very subtle think also that this idea is attracting my attention inward rest of the work is done by our guruji who transmits to us who sends out this pranahuti wherever you are you will experience that effect of pranahuti on you we'll sit like this for another 10 15 minutes later we'll, i'll take up questions so please gently close your eyes I'll walk you through this process of relaxation first. Think that the energy from mother earth is entering your system, your body through your feet which is helping us relax. permit this energy to move upward helping your lower legs and calf muscles and knees relax now please allow this energy to move upward to your thigh muscles and your hip area helping you relax meditating <laughs> you've got muted in allow this energy to move into your back helping you relax your back permit this energy to move in front your abdominal muscles and chest area Oh, thank you. Now allow this energy to move to your shoulders, shoulder muscles. Feel as if they are almost melting away and becoming. lighter allow this energy to descend into your arms allowing the energy to relax the entire arm including your palms and fingers now please pay attention to your neck muscles feel the relaxation there Thank you. 
drop your jaws and allow your tongue to float gently in your mouth. Let your lips, your nose, eyebrows, eyelids, forehead, your earlobes relax. Now, allow this energy to move upward, top of your head. Okay. Now scan the whole system from top to toe. And feel the relaxation. Whenever you practice this relaxation, anytime, and you feel any part of your body is not so relaxed and there is some tension, you can revisit that organ, the system, and help it relax, and then enter into meditation. Now you're ready to begin meditation. Focus on your heart. Think of the presence of divine light, which is attracting your attention inward. If other thoughts do come, let them. Gently, please remind yourself that I am meditating on presence of divine light.
बस कीजिए दैट्स ऑल सो जनरली वी प्रैक्टिस दिस मेडिटेशन फॉर हाफ आवर टू स्टार्ट विथ इन द मॉर्निंग और दो से उससे आई डोंट हैव टाइम दिस फिक्स द टाइमिंग एट लीस्ट एंड मेडिटेट इवन इफ इट इज फॉर टेन मिनट्स एंड सी हाउ इट रिवोल्यूशनाइज इज योर लाइफ ऑल टूगेदर इन द इवनिंग ऑल्सो वी हैव अ सिमिलर प्रैक्टिस how to remove our impressions or samskaras or what we call in science today as precognitive or cognitive biases and get out of all these complexities that we have created and before we go to sleep offer a simple prayer to god god without any face eh? cuz some people they say oh he has many heads and many hands and many legs i think it is imagination so that you know that he is greater than us he actually doesn't have a form it will be very humorous to even call such an entity as he or she who is beyond everything see so we have to pray and this prayer is very simple that my god i don't know you i haven't experienced you I like to feel your presence and i like to be one with you simple prayer and when we cry our hearts out and say my lord i really really want to feel your presence without any biases moment you bring in a bias which i was telling you about our cognitive bias you know you ask a lady especially elderly person or elderly man in his 80s or her 80s and you ask a simple question do you believe in god they say what kind of questions are you asking don't you think i am a believer of god i said say yes or no yes the next question you ask why do you believe in god then what will be their answer because my father taught me this my mother taught me this my religion taught me this my community taught me our shastras talk like this but what do you say have you experienced god then only one person in the whole humanity will come up persons like ramakrishna say yes i have experience you come here i'll explain make you experience this find such a guru they are there they will help you experience but this experience may not be as per your wishes because you would like to see me like a monkey or an elephant or someone hanging on a cross no then you will fail we have to move away from akal to nirakar all kinds of forms and go beyond forms also and formlessness then there is a hope that yes with such a neutral unbiased mind with innocent heart we can experience god moment you have any sort of bias you will spoil your experience so now having touched upon you know few aspects of spirituality i would like if you have any question we can tackle those questions you are muted hello can you hear me now yes thank yes. you sir thank you sir we have 
quite a few questions, but there wouldn't be time for all of them uh, as quite a few thousands of people are watching this. So I would like to take um, some questions. Dr. Sanjeev uh, Bakshi from Hyderabad has sent us, in fact, five questions. There wouldn't be time for that. But, uh, you know, he has this very basic question saying that um, how can wisdom be inculcated in a human being? And his next very important question is, that is inculcating wisdom enough? Or do you need some other ancillary qualities to uh, put it to good use? So we would start with that. Okay. So let us tackle with the answer, simple answer Swami Vivekananda gives that purpose of any spiritual practice is to arrive at expansion of consciousness. Now, if we consider that as the base or the ideal of our life, expansion of consciousness, what does it really mean? Consciousness in Hindi we call Chetana, Chit. Now, what is Chit? Chit is made up of three things, Manas, Buddhi and Ahankar. Mind, intellect and ego. That forms the basis of consciousness. Now, if I had to improve my consciousness, I have to improve these three basic elements, constituents, mind, intellect, and ego. How do I propel my mind? So I have to allow its function to improve. Mind's function is to think, Sochana. But I can, if I develop the ability of feeling things, as we were saying in our prayer, God, when we think of God, versus when I feel the presence of God, that's a big difference. Right? So we have to move away from thinking to feeling. And that happens Intuition. through yogic practices. Another example I give you, in, it's a practical example. I'm from my real life. I have done many businesses. And whenever I get into a trap, you know, I would spend weeks or months together thinking about that business problem. And, you know, mother would ask, or wife would ask, Kya huya? Kyo itne you look occupied. I said, question is nothing special. But they put their fingers in your mouth and take the words out. You know how our <laughs> families are. And you end up spilling your problems to your wife or mother. And abruptly, without a second breath, they will give you the answer. On which you have mentally spoiled your thoughts. And so, din mayna nikal dea is the dharakkar ke jawab de dea. Because they operate from a different level. Especially ladies, they feel, they think. So at an evolutionary level, the role of mind changes from thinking to feeling. Likewise, the gentleman who asked the question, Shiv from Hyderabad, what is wisdom? Wisdom is an evolved intellect. How we make our intellect more become evolved. intelligence. Intelligence evolved into intuition, intuition mm. into a kind of wisdom. Now, mm. if I develop this ability of not dissecting the problems, but intuitively arrive at a wisdom-based solution, I need not have gone through that experience at all. Generally, wisdom is considered as one who is very well experienced. And based on this experience, they make a wiser decisions. But yoga says, you need not have gone through a previous experience, but your intuitive heart will guide you whether this is right or wrong. And this can happen only when your heart and mind are still. They're calm, where every vibration is felt. How Rishi's in the past used to feel things, 
The slokas did not come in the form of words in Vedas. They came in the form of reach, uh, Shrutis. They, it descended in the form of vibrations. They felt it in their heart. And the heart transcribed those feelings into words. When we offer prayer, which is full of words, is now to reverse the process that these words should create feelings in my heart and these feelings will reach to God. Words are just a medium. Similarly, feelings, wisdom, intuition, whatever you may like to call, they all contribute in the evolution of my consciousness. Next question could be, what is this consciousness? What is backing this consciousness? As you say, we don't have time, but one day we'll sure discuss, or if you like, you can log into our website and look for such fundamental questions will be answered. And more than an answer, my interest is, don't look for answers, look for experience. If you can have any time, you log into one of our apps and request for meditation. You see, this is our app, Hearts app. You don't have to go to any guru's house or ashrams. You log, it, log into it from your bedroom, privacy of your home, and be guided through a trainer. A trainer could be anywhere. For example, you may be awake at two o'clock in the morning and you suddenly feel like, oh, I want to meditate. You can log use this app and see how that meditation helps you arrive at the most refined state of consciousness which you will really enjoy. See. True. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. That was wonderful. And we all would definitely want to achieve, as you said, this refined sense of consciousness, a more refined way of feeling and intuiting, as you said. Thank you once again for joining this platform and benefiting all of us. And uh, now we move on to our next guest speaker, who is Rosalia Ortega. Uh, Rosalia Ortega, we, uh, as uh, many of us know, that she was uh, the head of state of uh, Ecuador. And um, after, uh, after that, she had been completely involved in, um, in all kinds of social awareness programs uh, after she served her term as the president of Ecuador. And uh, she has also received, um, since her developmental act activities have impacted large-scale changes and benefits and improvements. In June 2007, she received the decoration of the Rio uh, Branco for meritorious service to Brazil. And today, she is going to talk about spirituality, global peace, and harmony, something that we very, very badly need in today's circumstances. We welcome... Her Excellency Rosalia Ortega. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to be here. I want to congratulate Dr. Canoria, Dr. Barma, and all the organizers of, of this uh, 13 uh, World Confluence of Humanity, um, Power, and Spirituality. I think it's a great effort in the circumstances that we are living now with this pandemic situation uh, to be um, with the possibility of organize such an impressive event. Um, I also want to congratulate all the leaders, the religious leaders, the political leaders, the social leaders that are part of this uh, big meeting. And um, I said, I can say that it's uh, for me uh, extraordinary to participate on this uh, event after this uh, moment of meditation. Uh, I, I feel inside me that it was good 
to meditate and to maintain silence and go deep inside ourselves. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my gratitude for this opportunity. Uh, as uh, the presenter says, I uh, had been in politics, but mainly in educational efforts. And I am still working a lot on education and peace efforts um, uh, all um, around the world, but especially in Latin America. I had also the opportunity to be the head of the organization, uh, the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. Then I had uh, the big duty to take care of the Amazon Basin, one of the biggest basin of the world. Then I understand more than ever, ever the link between uh, the nature, the, the, the nature uh, what uh, we can see on, on nature uh, in such a big forest and um, what we can do like uh, humanity to protect all the environment. Then um, my, my work has uh, been also involved a lot on environmental efforts. And now uh, talking about the global peace, the spirituality, the harmony, um, I strongly believe that um, we, the humanity has have to work every moment, every minute uh, to um, uh, make real the global peace. Uh, we know for sure there are some confrontations in several parts of the world, but at the same time, we know that there are personalities like Dr. Canoria and uh, all his staff that are working for global peace. And global peace has a lot to do with the in inner peace, how we feel, how we can react about situations, the interrelations between uh, people. That has a lot to do with harmony, uh, how uh, people can feel and how people can interact one with each other. I had the opportunity several, several times to attend the meetings organized by Canoria Foundation and also by the um, Universal uh, Spirituality and uh, um, uh, Humanity Foundation. Then it has been an opportunity to interact and to be in relation with a lot of people that has the same feelings. It doesn't matter religion, it doesn't matter where we are, in which country in the world we are, but we share all these uh, feelings and the sense of urgency to act um, in terms of uh, uh, work for the uh, world peace and how we can protect the harmony. And um, uh, thinking about how we can work in each uh, area, uh, I strongly believe in education like the best way to, to procure and to uh, get into this global peace. If we, if we don't uh, get concerned about the quality of education, it's a lot more difficult to work on it. In this uh, uh, current situation with the COVID-19 uh, uh, that is around the world, I am feeling that education is letting behind uh, because a lot of uh, children, a lot of uh, uh, teenagers, young people cannot have connection uh, to attend the classes. In countries like in Latin America and my own country, Ecuador, they had been uh, long periods of isolation and uh, not presential education. And of course it is right because we have to protect the health of the people but in the other hand, uh, lots of them, lots of, uh, of, of people that has to, to be educated and to participate in, in programs in schools, et cetera, cannot do it because they don't have the connectivity, they don't have the devices, and probably the teachers are not prepared for uh, online or long distance uh, education. Then uh, the challenge is big. Um, the opportunities are there and we must act in terms of uh, how we can provide the tools, how we can provide our advice, uh, maybe making associations, maybe asking, uh, for example, students 
of universities to be mentors and tutors and help the teachers in their duties. That's one of the things that I am working on. And I feel that it matched perfectly with this uh, commitment of global peace, of harmony, harmony, of spirituality. We are more than bodies and we need to feed the spirit and to feed our souls with all these kind of um, uh, reflections of uh, uh, mental support of um, spirituality that can help us to be stronger and stronger and continue working um, with the people and for the people. Uh, I thank a lot the opportunity to share these thoughts and um, I am totally agree with the commitments that uh, this uh, organization and this big event um, has. And you can count on me to do whatever is possible to continue working for global peace. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I really feel that we can do more together. Thanks again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, because as you know that this world confluence is being watched by thousands of people all over the world. And therefore, we have questions from people um, in, in different parts of the world. There is this place called Chandanagar, which is very close to Kolkata. It is one of, you can almost say it's a suburb of Kolkata. And from there, Mr. Kartik Gupta has asked this question. What is this understanding? What is this special level of consciousness or understanding which allows a person to feel free? In other words, what constitutes this feeling of being free in a person? Yeah, uh, it is such an impressive uh, question. And I am happy because uh, this last, uh, this year, with this uh, impossibility and with the isolation, I had a, a lot of contact with people from India. And I am mentoring a group of students and a group of uh, young people from all over India and participating in their meetings. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel this understanding, um, this, this uh, possibility uh, of, of, of feel the spirituality it has a lot to do with the um, knowledge, with the knowledge about ourselves and the knowledge about the world, how we can handle it. It is knowing uh, ourselves and it's knowing uh, what is surrounding us. It could be uh, understanding at some uh, uh, like something simple, but it's not so simple because uh, you need to be conscious about who you are, where you are, what you want to get. And I feel that that's a way of understanding that make us as better human beings. Thank you so much. We have another question for you. Uh, being the president of a nation is, of course, a huge, huge responsibility. Not everyone can, you know, sort of uh, do it, but you have done it. And uh, any decision that you took would have impacted not only uh, your country, your nation, but world peace and harmony in general. So how has spirituality helped you to take these decisions so that global peace and harmony would be impacted in a positive way at, by your decisions as a president, as the president of Ecuador? Thank you very much for the question. I had the big honor to have been the first female Minister of Education, Culture and Sports of my country, and also the first female uh, Vice President and President of Ecuador. It has been a, a big challenge. And uh, of course, uh, I was happy with it, but it means a lot of responsibility. I assume it like a big responsibility because being a woman 
put the eyes of the people, uh, not only of my country, but from the world on what you are doing, what you are uh, feeling, how you can impact others. And uh, I, I used to say that when it's a, a, a man that failure in, in some position, you can say that man failure. But when it's a woman that fails, the people say all the women's <laughs> fail. Then the responsibility is <laughs> bigger and bigger and bigger. And I feel it all the time. Uh, I also, because um, uh, the question asked uh, about how I can manage it and how we, uh, I can empower myself. I had big, uh, really hard situations in my life. Uh, when I was, I was very young, I lose one of my kids that was born um, and he uh, unfortunately passed away when he had less than a year, 10 months. months. And uh, I, I feel at that time, I was feeling that I cannot, uh, I cannot handle it, that my life was going to an end but I found uh, ways to, to get that resilience that it's so important. Uh, first, I decided to write a book about what was, I, I was feeling. And I, I wrote a book about my kid, Geronimo was his name. And it makes me like a catharsis, feeling that I share right. my feelings with the other people, how um, some other people can confront this kind of situation uh, with my experience and how I can help them. It makes, uh, and, and, and you probably ask why you are telling this story if I ask about the presidents, because I am the same person. And I feel that I get stronger this, with these re, that, real situations. And when I get in power, I feel that I can do more for the people because I was stronger. I get stronger with this personal story and situation. Uh, then uh, my, my main commitments were about social efforts. Ca how can I impact in people in health issues and um, uh, work issues and e education issues? I think, and, and that's, it's my goal in life. Uh, then I, I didn't stop my work when I leave the political situations. I am not more in political situations these last 20 years, but I continue be, being very busy, visible for the community because I'm also a journalist. I impact uh, in, in television, in radio, and uh, in the newspapers programs because I maintain permanent uh, uh, the idea to be positive. Uh, even in the situations that we are living now in the world, we maintain the, the position to be positive, to look forward, to have hope, to maintain uh, these strongest spiritual values that let us continue, continue because life is not stopping. Uh, even if you have big challenges in your life, you cannot stop. You can continue for yourself and for the others that are surrounding you. And in, in, my, in my situation, in my situation, because I had been president of the Republic, the surrounding is very big. It's not only the personal surrounding, the, the family, the members of, of your network, but all the uh, a country. Then uh, I still maintain the idea that I can be stronger and help others and continue uh, maintaining the, the link uh, between uh, myself and the people, not only from Ecuador, from, but from other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. And you are truly uh, an example for everyone, for every person to follow, not only a woman. Gracias. Thank you once again. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we now welcome uh, Dr. Kavita Gupta IS. Um, I would request all our viewers all over the world to give me some time because the achievements of Dr. Kavita Gupta are so many and so varied that it would take me a little bit of time to even touch upon them. She is a PhD in economics from the Prescott University, London, United Kingdom. And she has 
One, two, three, four masters. Mind you, four masters in physics, engineering from IIT Delhi, MTech in behavioral and social sciences, again from IIT Delhi, masters in international law and international economics from the World Trade University Institute, sorry, Bern, uh, Switzerland, where she was awarded the Sumakam Lord, which is the rarest and the highest honor uh, goes without saying. She also participated in an executive education program at Harvard Kennedy School, United States of America, and was awarded a certificate on infrastructure in a market economy, public-private partnerships in a changing world, so very relevant to the world, but particularly to our country, India. She also earlier participated in an international program on women mean business, don't they just, from DUBS, that is the Durham University Business School, United Kingdom, and was awarded a certificate. And her topic absolutely is born out of the various areas of her study, of her research, of her work experience, spirituality to aspire and inspire the youth. We look forward, ma'am. Thank you so much. My gratitude to Dr. H.P. Kanuria Ji, chairperson of the Universal Spirituality and Humanity Foundation. And I very warmly thank Heman Ji, the chairperson of Shea Group, for giving me this great opportunity to share with all of you my journey through life. The topic was spirituality to aspire and to inspire the youth. So I thought a journey through anyone's life is some kind of an inspiration. So I thought I'd just put all my uh, story together and see how, uh, what are the insights which I got through that. It has been a journey full of challenges, but also one so wonderfully protected by the masters. I'm also wonderfully grateful to the mighty universe for putting me today on this dais with my spiritual master, Daji, Dr. Kamlesh Patel, also with Sister Shivani, whom I really admire and adore, with Swami Giriji, with Venerable Bhikkhu Sangasena, with Mr. Shivakthira, and with, Mr., uh, with uh, Anuradha Ji, and all other luminous stars who were there, or who are going to be there as speakers in this two-day function, a program, a celebration on spirituality. I wish to present in this limited time a very capsulated version of the insights I got and the life lessons that I learned as I waded my way through. My life has been a roller coaster ride. It has been full of adventures, many of which I lured just to add spice in my life. And then of course, I knew that it was not a very good idea. My father was an army officer and this promised me very frequent shifts and changes. I went through a record 13 schools in just 11 years. It was also a time of learning and growing up. My elder sister, Amita, was my best friend and also my philosopher and guide. I could not have asked for a better best friend than Amita. My mother was an infinite ocean of love and care and most certainly, my raison d'etre, my reason for existence. I, however, felt my father somewhat distant. He was also a strict disciplinarian, and that made me so rebellious. I later also had repeated problems with many bosses who represented authority figures. So now, as I look back, I see a visible pattern which brought me my first insight. I'm going to discuss on the various insights which I have gone through and found. My first insight was that there are certain patterns that repeat 
again and again and again. Such patterns are there to teach us some important lesson. I learned that in each life, we come to break patterns, etched and strengthened over many lifetimes. I also learned that we do not belong to this planet. Yes, we do not belong to this planet, but have come from elsewhere with specific soul plans to evolve spiritually. In other words, material progress is relevant to the soul plan only to the extent that it helps us to evolve spiritually. We have to the, see the signs and work upon these signs. We require to go to the roots of the problem and release trapped energies from our cellular memory so that we can be liberated from the burdens which weigh upon our entire being. In my case, some of the trapped energies did perhaps from the entanglements with authority figures, which I carried from many past lives. I also learned that once the cellular memory is released, it is a quantum leap in our spiritual journey. As I went to the roots of these repetitive patterns through various healing modalities, I realized that in fact, my father was not a perpetrator at all, but probably a victim himself. This was a great revelation, since in spite of all the love and respect I had for him all these years, I had always felt hesitant with him. Here, I got my second insight. My second insight was that we always require to go deeper and deeper into layers of our consciousness. As Daji said, we have to remove our sanskaras. We have to go deeper and deeper into the layers of consciousness. And as we cut across these layers, we come across deeper revelations. And with it, our conclusions could in fact reverse. What appears on the face of it often is not. Here, the principle which our Babuji Maharaj also says very often, the principle of invertendo operates, which means that what we may think is, is usually not. It is usually the reverse. It, I also kind of learned that we always are the solution. We are the solution and never a mere statement of a problem. We are a cause of our own healing. So this is, was a great insight which I got that we are the solution and we are a cause of our healing and we are not a statement of a problem. As part of my journey, I was deeply inspired by Siddharth who became Buddha. And I too wanted to go to the forest in search of truth. And I too wanted to become a Buddha, but destiny did not have it that way for me. And instead, I unwillingly appeared for the IIT entrance examination. And unfortunately, I qualified it. So I was compelled to do my master's in physics with credits in engineering. I was a national science talent scholar also. And therefore, for five years, every summer, I attended scientific summer schools where I pursued my interest in astrophysics something which I'm now thankful for. Science, of course, is closest to spirituality. So I got my third important insight. My third insight was that if we get what we do not wish for, I repeat, if we get what we do not wish for, we are blessed. Which means that if we get something which we didn't want, it means that there is a divine hand working and showering a blessing, the true import of which we know only later. My father was staunchly patriotic. And when I expressed my wish to pursue, pursue my career in astrophysics, he said, what if you discover a galaxy? How would it change the lives of millions of poor people in this country? 
So I had to appear for the civil service examination. I was underage and how I wished I had not lost that one precious year for my seniority. I enrolled in IIT Delhi for masters in behavioral and social sciences, something which interested me well. I was exposed to Marxist, Das Capital, and the various political philosophers. It was eye-opening, and it also inflamed in me my rebellious tendencies and the fight for the right. So it infused in me a great sensitivity towards the weak and the proletariat, something which I retain and maintain all through my career. I got my fourth insight. My fourth insight was everything works towards a life purpose. Yes, we all have a life purpose and everything is goading us towards that. We choose a life to fulfill a life purpose and our destiny conspires with the universe to fulfill that. I did not qualify in the IAS, but selected. I was, in fact, I got selected in the Group A Customs and Central Excise Service in my previous attempt, as I lost my precious three marks only because of the interview. In the interview, I had answered regarding the reservation policy. I had said that the benefits should be availed only till the third generation so that these benefits could be divided more evenly. An idea which is now in vogue after 35 years. Here, as I look back, I got my fifth insight. My fifth insight was visionaries lose out in the structure of the Leviathan. The Leviathan believes in the status quo, but for innovations and fresh outlook to come in public administration, visionaries must step in nonetheless. I appeared again in the civil service examination, much against my will. And yes, it was more on my astrologer's insistence. I did not study much, did not do half as well. But lo and behold, as I was preparing to appear for my customs departmental examination, I got the interview call. And I again appeared in the civil service interview reluctantly and totally unprepared for it. I spoke randomly and philosophically and could not believe it when I actually qualified in the IAS in 1985, this time mainly because of the interview. This was my sixth insight. My sixth insight was stars and planets do play a part in human destinies, which also means that there is a higher cosmic force moving our lives. The important part is there is a higher cosmic force which is moving our lives. I was allotted the Maharashtra Kadar, the capital of which is Mumbai, a coastal city. And the state's history, as all of you know, is heavily influenced by Chhatrapati Shivaji. That as a little child, I had kept a small statue of Shivaji Maharaj on my study table for years together as an inspiration and had painted only seas and ships as a young girl. I got my seventh insight. My seventh insight was life is well charted out even before we are born. And we do know, we do know consciously where we are moving towards. I entered the service and was posted at Ramte, an ancient and important pilgrimage town. There was a church in one of the talukas, and also probably the only place where I could speak English with the priests and the nuns. I often visited there and learned and practiced the Catholic faith in good measure. I studied in depth all the apostles and the Bible, the power of surrendering love and the great sacrifice at the cross. Yet I also yearned to learn 
Bhagavad Gita, and lo and behold, again, one fine day, my first spiritual guru appeared at my door. I learned the pujas. I learned the rich spiritual culture of Maharashtra. I learned about its spiritual saints. I learned about Sant Gyaneshwar Maharaj, Guru Ramdas, Sai Baba Shidi, and others. I learned the scriptures, including portions of Patanjal's Yog Shastra, and of course, the words of the Lord written in Bhagavad Gita. I wrote my first book on the temple of Ramte and the holy places around. I saw existence over there in simultaneous planes in that place and the rishis meditating in hidden caves in the other dimension as also the processions on the hillocks. I got my eighth insight. My eighth insight was our soul's longing attracts our spiritual guru who is meant to transmit spiritual learning to us. I think some of you got the spiritual learning today from that. <laughs> so your soul's uh, longing is attracting you towards this path. All that are present over here. Further, I also got the insight that there are multiple dimensions coexisting and oblivious of each other in the same space. The cosmic plan plays its leela through all of them. I was then posted to Ratnagiri and then to Vardha, which was a political pilgrimage. I closely interacted with Gandhiji's daughter-in-law at Sevagram Ashram and with the functionaries at Pinobaji's Paunar Ashram. I conducted and completed the total literacy program. I also put in parts of in fact, I innovated this value education and creative education system at that time. That is, I'm talking about 32 years back. Uh, and in the district, I introduced it in all the schools where I had told that I had asked the teachers not to open the books and only to inculcate values and build creativity through games and other aspects. Vardha had been one of the first two districts in the country and having completed this total literacy campaign successfully for the age group 15 to 35 years after a meticulous and painstaking effort, I, along with my team, was felicitated by the UNESCO Secretary General for achieving our goal. The district and my team of 3,000 teachers, they exhilarated. All through, I did not want to marry, but my father's guru, and in many ways mine, said that I must marry, not for pleasure, but to walk through fire. It is then, when on the very day that I was leaving from Mumbai for my district posting at Jalna, a district near Aurangabad, a district where I was to put all my engineering acumen in mapping the aquifers way back, 30 years back, using satellite imagery that I met my husband and subsequently married him without my parents' consent. I knew I would not get their consent because he was practicing another faith, Islam. My parents had all along never wanted me to marry someone of that faith having gone through the traumas of partition. And here I stood before them with my husband and now going through the Vedic marriage also. Marriage, of course, brought me a lot of learning and I thanked that learning. I also got my ninth insight, which brought me a great lesson. My ninth insight was, we cannot control our fate. We have to live our destiny. Yet that is a part of the soul plan, and all suffering is towards the fulfillment of our soul plan. In fact, as the masters say, sufferings are the great blessings. They teach us so much, and the fire of suffering purifies so much. It purifies gold into pure gold. After marriage, I was posted in sales tax enforcement department, where I conducted raids in forbidden territories, 
Now I think they were daredevil acts bordering foolhardiness. And later I was posted as lottery commissioner. In both the places, I saw the entrenchments of various occupations into the Levithan, even as they were expected to be ethically opposed to each other. It was an eye opener and my eyes have never ceased the journey of opening wider and wider as they continue to see the so-called reality till I now think it must have been my 10th insight. My 10th insight was there is a thin line between truth, perception and falsehood, that which is not. We are deluded by a magnificent perception error. Each person has his unique delusion, which results in different points of view. It creates relative truths. Since each person has his or her unique truth and he or she is strongly devoted to it, he or she takes positions creating problems in life and relationships. This is what precisely results in religious incongruity, ego posturing, or anything else. I struggled with these perplexities as I fondly remembered my quantum physics equations, which in spite of their uncertainty dynamics, were far more certain than the real life situations. While my endeavor as secretary finance on computerizing treasuries was highly successful, my pursuit of creating a framework for outcome budget got stalled at the 12th hour after I had painstakingly worked on it for two years and had come up with a final report. After all the interactions with the user departments and the TISs, with the innovative conception of a path-breaking revolutionary framework, the hard work and the painstaking efforts not seeing the light of the day, even as 1,500 copies of 800 pages report each gathered dust in Mantrale, I went to Switzerland to further my education in the World Trade Institute Perth and did my two masters in international law and in international economics. This was a decision I had postponed for six long years and now this heartbreak saw me taking it. The education at WTI was an illuminating experience as I interacted with students of 25 countries, including students from Europe, America, Asia, including China, Africa, and the Far East. It opened me to a world vision not known firsthand before. I went through the rigors of learning. This was one of the toughest programs and I labored hard. I topped in the world and was awarded summa cum laude, which is the highest and the rarest honor, and also the first time they had given it to someone. I came back changed in many ways and more confident of a broader and more objective approach. I also got my 11th insight and learned my 11th lesson. My 11th insight was beyond all frustrations and heartbreaks is a hope and a divine healing, a destiny which awaits and a path which requires to be followed. She's I think somebody has gone out. I came back and was posted in labor department. In the labor department, with all the skills gathered on international negotiations, I negotiated n number of settlements between the industries and labor units, including major ones which were pending for 15 to 20 years. I also conceptualized, formulated, and successfully implemented on a pilot basis, a labor management system, a win-win framework for both industries and labor, including for unorganized labor, which are usually left out. I presented in Geneva and Turin to the ILO, and after verifying the success of the pilot, the ILO included it as an international best practice. Soon after, the then chief minister declared a statewide 
roll out. However, immediately thereafter, I got my deputation in Government of India, Ministry of Commerce as additional Director General Foreign Trade in Mumbai. As soon as I stepped out of the Labor Department, the project of labor management system was systematically destroyed and dismantled. This was in stark contrast to my conception and implementation of the women's self-help group movement through IFAD funding, International Finance for Agricultural Development funding, which had been innovatively created by me for the first time ever through a government organization and which was replicated in other states and also had been expanded to many more districts by my esteemed successors, both of whom were women. Only because of this taking forward of the project by my successors that the Maharashtra self-help group movement saw recognition by the World Bank. I therein got my 12th insight and learned my 12th lesson. My 12th insight was, we can create a legacy, but to carry forth the legacy, we need big and nurturing hearts, hearts that would own it. We also need a long vision, a vision like that of a mother eagle, a vision which could take forth the legacy with alacrity and grace. I further introspected into my incomplete projects and later wondered whether it could also be due to an an interruption of love flow from the ancestors. Loves and blessings have to flow from the ancestors and through the parents. Complicated distortions could be possible in family matrix. Also the child could occasionally feel hurt, creating inner child issues. All this requires to be healed for the best manifestation of the flow of love and blessings. I just have another insight and then I conclude very short, briefly. As textile commissioner, government of India, uh, I traveled like never before and worked arduously for promoting technical textiles, research and development and the Indian cotton. As textile commissioner of India, my efforts in technical textiles have now seen the real impact during the outbreak of the pandemic COVID-19 as factories churned masks, gloves, PPEs, etc., all made of technical textiles. It is a very proud moment for me. It is also important for me to say that also at this phase of my journey, I did not get support from where I was very much expecting the same. I found myself away from the seat of power and in the midst of a financial institution I was MDC Com. While it exposed me directly to the banking sector, it also freed a lot of my time from time consuming meetings. Due to this, I found a golden chance to go deeper into fields, which had always interested me. While I continued to do my work uncompromisingly, I also went deeper into meditation and I simultaneously also learned various modalities of spiritual healing <clears throat> and the various energy works. I stepped into a different reality, a reality which was far more encompassing. My spiritual journey had probably started in rhythm and in full measure. I got my 13th insight and learned my 13th and the most important lesson. My 13th insight was what is remains invisible in these illusions. This only means that in this illusionary existence, we do not see the real. What appears to be is usually not. In other words, appearances are false. The real power is the power within. Ever since I have been gathering the golden dust of love, love which is the universal energy and to which everybody responds without exception. I also learned that the world is a mirror and when we change our emotions towards a person, our projections of that person in our consciousness and in our subconscious mind changes. With this change of our projection, his or her response also changes. I've captured some of these insights in my novel, Love Only. It is a story of a soul in search 
It is a story of love and deceit and otherworldly wilderness. It integrates various philosophical thoughts. I may be one of the few people who is a practicing Hindu. Also, I'm a practicing Sufi, a practicing Buddhist, and also one who has practiced Christianity. Just to give a flavor of the novel, I would like, if you can just bear with me, I would like to read, read a small excerpt from it. Anjali realized that the working of nature is perfect and perfection balances itself delicately. Sensitivity and stability are precariously proportioned. Nature in a, is in a state of perfect mindfulness. It is constantly alert and vigilant. Nature evolves in this mindfulness. It plays in this mindfulness and procreates in this mindfulness. That is why everything in nature is in perfect harmony. That is why nature is in constant celebration. And that is why everything operates in nature effortlessly. My novel now is available on Amazon. With the onset of COVID-19, I also observed my first rosas for the complete 30 days in the holy month of Ramadan. And I realized the truth of fasting as also the truth that all religions are universal and equally true. They create fields which unite and merge at a higher vibration energy and create an ensemble of such unparalleled energy flow that it can pull up the vibration level of the entire planet like a vortex or a whirlpool. The sole purpose of every person in this planet is to align the energies and allow the energy field to move upwards and attract energy fields and vibrations of every other person, irrespective of the religious faith, so that all these vibration energies coalesce and move upwards, pulling up the vibration energy of the entire planet. I also learned that now our planet is in that critical orbit when it is closest to another orbit, which is at a much higher vibrational level. If the vibration level of the entire planet goes up, the planet will be sucked into this orbit with a higher vibration level. Time is short. It will be sucked in that plane. Of course, we'll be still intact, but we'll be sucked in that plane. Time is short and it's only till 2022, where it would stay. And then it would work with other planets and other spaces at their energy level and become a participant in the process of going still higher up. The journey is towards infinity, but at each higher vibration level, the life index, the love index, the happiness index shift in a quantum way. We continue this journey. But to complete the journey, we have to all move together. Nobody can be left behind. The journey is from hallowed graves rises the phoenix, a sacred space in silence speaks. From mythical Atlantis, a sphinx regenerates to integrate the diverse into one. In unity, a universe celebrates life. In unity, a universe celebrates life. A universe because they have multiple universes. In unity, prayer fields resonate to the tunes of Shambhala. Souls coalesce into one, matching none. Yes, he has no match. We all coalesce into him, matching one. Coalesce into one, matching none. Thank you very much once again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for, and I'm sorry for exceeding the time, but there was so much to be said in this short time that I had to just uh, say it. <laughs> no, and we want to hear more from you because we have several questions, in fact. Okay. Um, since people, since the morning, um, thousands of people have been watching this. In fact, 5,000 people have registered for uh -huh. this World Confluence. So we have this question from 
Roshni Narayan. Uh, she she is based in Mumbai. She uh, has a very pertinent question. Uh, throughout your address, we found that you you very deeply believe in destiny. Um, you have a tremendous core of spirituality. And at the same time, your studies and your work areas have, um, you know, forced you to remain in the domain of logic all the time. So how are these three things, spirituality, logic, and destiny aligned? How have you managed to coalesce them together? Right. So as uh, the masters would uh, say, uh, when we align all our energies together, the mind, body, and the spirit, that is what is yoga. And uh, so the logic has to be aligned with the destiny, which is the ultimate cosmic plan. And we also have to liberate ourselves of patterns. And we also have to go through this entire path in a very, very spiritual manner so that you know we have the right attitude what the masters say you have to have the right attitude the destiny will not you know the maybe the sequence of events may still remain the same but the, the attitude towards the <coughs> will change you will not suffer you will learn you will gain insights you will get deeper to yourself it will be a, the suffering that is when the suffering becomes a blessing is, that is why the masters say it is all sufferings are great blessings. We should, in fact, thank uh, God for giving us sufferings. So, the logic is something which has to be there. Logic is a spirit of science and a spirit of uh, inquiry, and uh, also a methodical way of reaching into certain solutions. That is the conscious mind. But above that, you have the superconscious, and below that, you have the subconscious and all the three have to come together to form a whole and to have the full yoga at all levels and at all dimensions. Great. You say that sufferings are a great blessing. So yeah. how is the pandemic a blessing for you? Uh, well, or for all humanity? I think the, this is what I said uh, right at the end. Uh, we are, you know, this uh, journey towards uh, the higher orbit or higher vibration level started sometime in 2019. And we have a time period only till 2022. So we have this three years And in this three years period, the entire planet has to rise to that vibration level. Uh, come up to that to be able to integrate with that uh, higher vibration level orbit so now during covid invariably if you talk to anyone they have gone deeper into meditation they have come closer in their families they have become more and more inside looking they have got into yoga so these are the ways where we are planning above to that higher vibration level and that it that how COVID has helped us in getting us okay and we are now moving forward for another six seven months then the whole planet as a whole like your international world conference is also going to contribute in helping right. everybody coming together sure. and rising up Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. Thanks once again. Thanks a lot. Right. And now we have uh, been waiting for uh, Swami Nigamananda Giri. He's already with us. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Swamiji. He's a senior monk of the Yogada Satsanga Society, which is, uh, in fact, for the last hundred years, for the last century, Yogada Satsang Society of India has been dedicated to carrying on spiritual and humanitarian work of its founder, Paramahansa Yogananda, who has been uh, considered the world over as the founder of yoga. Can we now invite and welcome and seek the blessings of Swami Nigamananda Giri?
प्रणाम coming to this conference i just got reminded of a wonderful thought expressed by charlie chaplin he said life laughs at you when you are unhappy life smiles at you when you are happy and life salutes you when you make others happy this apparently is one of the thoughts of this conference where i am supposed to speak on the subject of humanity power and spirituality many of us here would be well aware of this particular poem which you have learned i guess and recited umpteen times from our school days and this particular poem more or less captures the spirit of this congregation where so many of the speakers who have demonstrated in their own lives the understanding of both humanity and spirituality together abu ben hadam may strive in kris i'll try to speak of this poem not exactly i might change it here and there for for the short time that i have to speak about my topic abu ben hadam may his tribe increase i woke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw in his room an angel writing on a book of in a book of gold abu ben hadam asked him what is it that you are writing and the presence in the room replied the names of those who love the lord abu ben adam asked is my name one nay not so then abu ben adam god knows what got into him he asked then put my name down as one who loves his fellow men he did so the spirit the presence in the room did so and left but he returned the next day next night and showed him the names whom the love of god had blessed and lo ben hadam's name laid all the rest 1894 swami sri yukteshwar ji who happened to be the guru of paramahansa yogananda was moving through the grounds of kumbh mela in alabag he apparently had the same kind of thought reflecting over the particular scenario that he was encountering with so many people so much crowd so much noise in that area he thought to himself whether the people the scientists who are carrying out such great research for the humanity locked up in their rooms are they not are they not better loved by the divine the thought came to him whether they are dedicating their lives to such for the welfare of humanity are they not spiritual that kind of thought emerged in his consciousness around that time he met a great servant great master in the kumbh mela mahavatar baba ji who apparently understood the thought that passed through some sweetesh just mind and he said the time has come when the spirituality of india and the materiality with with which the west is so rich will be in exchange and india has a good part to play and even swami sweetesh ji had a good part to play in it he said flood like thoughts this thoughts of other men great men come from the west to him who are wake awaiting to be awakened years later a young lad met swami yukteshwar ji very much exactly as mahavata baba ji had mentioned that lad would meet him and swami yukteshwar ji trained him 
and sent him to the West with that immortal message of India of the yoga science. And that was Paramahansa Yogananda who carried that eternal message of truth, of that power, the potency of that yoga science, which as Babaji had said, will help people understand the deeper thing and on the foundation thereof, understand his beliefs in the West. Paramahansa Yogananda writes in his autobiography of a yogi about his early years in master's hermitage. In there, in the early years, he said that he had come with certain notions about the chela or a spiritual aspirant need not really concern himself so much of about so many duties, mundane duties, etc. But this thought was soon removed under the wonderful training, rigorous training of his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji. Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji one day said to him, those who are too good for this world are already adorning another. He said, so long as you breathe the free air of this earth, you are duty bound, obligated to serve the people. Only those who have attained the breathless state are freed of this necessity. And he added, Swami Sri Chachi, I'll not fail to let you know when you have attained that state of perfection. That state of perfection that Swami Sri Ji speaks about, what could that be, that high state of perfection? Many of us here among the audience and others would be well aware of the famous text Mandukka Karika by Gaurapad. He who happened to be the Param Guru of Adi Shankaracharya. This Karika speaks of the highest essence of spirituality. And in there, something he says on which Shankaracharya comments. Shankaracharya says that high state of elevation that these great masters attain is such that they feel attunement with all being. And in that attunement, they serve all people. Even the gods fail to understand, fail to follow in the strides of these men who apparently fly like birds, leaving no track behind. That means even those great spiritual souls embrace this concept of humanity, which is become which becomes a part of their beings. And Sarvabhuta Hite Rataha, as Gita says, ever thinking, considering the world around, the people around. Paramahansa Yogananda says, life should be chiefly of service. Without that idol, the intelligence that God has given man does not reach towards his goal. When in service, you forget the little self, the big self of spirit is felt within. But there is a confusion that often comes as it did to Arjuna. When Krishna spoke to him and spoke and said about that high state of experiences that, uh, that, one, ex that has, one has in spirituality. Soon after he follows it up saying that one should fight the battle of his life. Arjuna was in dilemma. He wondered, how is it? Asking a boy to come and sit down and study and at the same time asking him to go and play. How does he do the, both the things at the same time? Quite a dilemma indeed. You're confusing me, Lord, with this kind of statement. If you consider, if you consider it's greater, 
karmanasya mata buddhir janardana. If wisdom is greater than work, why do you engage me in this horrendous activity of war? Commenting on this, Paramahansa Yoganiji says that to attain the highest state of consciousness, there are certain rungs along the way, whether it be social, whether it be moral, religious, or meditation. They're all spiritual activities leading to that goal. And he gives a wonderful analogy. He says, just like the flower and the fruit. Fruit is the final essence of a tree, but the flower is essential for its attainment, for the tree to bludgeon and become, uh, have the fruits. So until the fruits come, flowers remain. When the, flowers, when the fruits come, flowers drop off. But until then, flowers are essential. So flowers of activity, spiritual activity, religious activity, social activities are important to attain that state of consciousness of spirituality. A lot of inspirations are given by great souls about this. In these worlds, there's nothing left to be attained by those who are all the time thinking of the welfare of others. Their, all their difficulties are gone those who are all the time engaged in paropakar, in the welfare of others. And Ridae Satam, all the time in his consciousness, how he can help others, that kind of thought is always there. Sampada Suyupade Pade. In every step, he gets a lot of wealth, an inner external wealth. Sampada Suyupade Pade. Paramahansa Yogananji speaks about it and says, it's sad to see people who are suffering. God feels sad when people are suffering. In a higher state of consciousness, he is one with the infinite in that awareness. But then there's another being of his, his consciousness in the world around him. And it saddens him to suffer. And to the degree that one removes the woes of people, to that degree, he, one removes that suffering from God also. This thought was something which affected one of our devotees in Los Angeles, Dennis Weaver. And he reflected on it and he said, it, is just, it, it struck me like a ton of bricks. One removes it from God also. Is that not an instant incentive enough to serve humanity, serve the people? He started an organization, Life. Love in feeding everybody. And 1,50,000 people every week were fed by him. Those who were malnourished, needing food, even in a place like Los Angeles County, where he lived and served. And for years together, that mission continued feeding so many people every day, every week, so to say. He said, he was so much drawn to Paramahansa Yoga and his teachings. He said that indeed, to feel that love, one has to go into meditation, experience one's association with the divine. And in and through that association, one feels an a kind of closeness with the people around and who cannot but want to serve them. At an interview, he was asked what might have motivated him to this service. He found the question rather strange. He said, I'm seeing people going hungry. Is that not motivation enough? But then he also said, there's yet another thought that in serving people, there's a joy in the heart, in service. So in a one way, it cannot really be called altruistic because there is an interest of the joy in our heart. 
one might not consciously seek it, but one experiences it nevertheless. And to the degree one serves humanity, he feels a fulfillment inside him. Paramahansa Yoganiji says that what is success? Basically, one should realize that life is a joyous battle of duty and at the same time a passing dream. And if you are engaged in removing the suffering of people to giving them love and peace and joy, then in the eyes of God, your life is a success. Sisi Dayamataji, who had been the Sangamata of our organization for a pretty long time, she remarked, spirituality is of course important to give an edge to us, to one's humanitarian activities, efforts, endeavors. In that, she says that what if we didn't have the power in us to serve? What if God took away the power to us serve? Then how do you do it? So acknowledging the presence of the divine within us consciously, it helps the humanity effort. Not only that, one might serve humanity. Often it might be that you are serving somebody who, might, who, who is trying to do harm to another. You might have do, done something, you might have healed him, but he continues in his bad ways. But if a person who is a healer, he himself understands his spirituality and does good, he himself is good then it transmits that goodness into the healed one. And therefore, in a way, he helps humanity in a, of a, in a higher status, in a way that people continue to do good and people to get transformed. So life is one in which this continuity of wanting to serve and continuing to make people better all through. One needs strength to do this. One needs a power to do this. In fact, that is one of the top, one of the uh, part of our talk today. I might have that humanity spirit, but often it might so happen that whatever service we might be doing to another, it is not recognized, or you might be looked down upon as one of the great uh, philanthropists that we all are aware of, Vidya Sagar, he experienced Somebody came and told him that, you know, Swan so person was speaking ill of you. With this, I was scratched his head and said, well, I don't really remember the having done anything good to this person, having benefited him in any way. I wonder why is he speaking ill of me? Strange. People speak ill of you when you are doing good to them. You might. People might discourage you. And one might feel little off in one's wanting to serve people, what does he get? Thankless job, so to say. How does one go over it? Humility. It is said that humility is some quality, if you can acquire it, that helps you in a way to sustain yourself amidst all the criticisms around you. It is said, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu never wrote really anything except just eight stanzas. And in one of the stanzas therein, he speaks of being lesser than the grass or the straw. Think yourself as lesser than the grass or the straw. And be sahishnu, be enduring like a tree. The tree is chopped, but the tree yet continues to give shelter and respect those whom others may not respect. So always go around in that. Lahari Mahashar, who happens to be the guru of Swami Sri Yukteswa Ji and the Param Guru of Paramahansa Yogananda, he said once on an occasion from his office, he got us some free time and he happened to go to Kumbh Mela of Allahabad, which is Allahabad was close to his place where, he's, where he worked and stayed. And there for a short time he went and he was moving through the grounds and he saw there a sadhu sitting there, an anchorite, and he looked aghast at him 
with a begging bowl, you are sitting, and Larry Marshall thought that this person might be a hypocrite. He passed him by and he came to another person and he found his own guru, Mahavatar Babaji, was attending to him. And he rushed to his side. Babaji, what are you doing, Gurudev? Babaji said, I'm just washing his feet and then I'm going to wash his utensils, which he has, which he has used. And then he smiled and with a laughingly, with a child's smile, he said that through serving the people, good and bad, saints and hypocrites all over, wherever, I'm learning the greatest virtue that pleases God, humility. Having that as a part of your consciousness, you serve humanity and you get empowered. This is important on the spiritual path to protect and proceed in our lives. I might close with one short verse of Paramahansa Yoganandji, which per perhaps encapsulates the entire theme of this talk, actually carrying all these three thoughts here. Weep tears as a none have shed for God. Give peace to all whom none other gave. Claim him your own, who is everywhere disclaimed. Love all as none have felt. And brave the battle of life with strength unchanged. The first line speaks of spirituality. The last line speaks of the power and the lines in between speaks of humanity. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. There Thank you so me. much. Welcome. Thank you so much. Swami Nigamananda Giri, thank you so much for these wonderful revelations that you shared with us. Uh, the 13th World Confluence uh, reaches almost the termination of the first day, the end of the first day, and uh, we have Dr. Sanjeev Kanoria in London today. Uh, he would be summing up today's uh, world con the first day of the World Confluence, and he would be joining us from London. So we welcome Dr. Sanjeev Kanoria. Hello. Are you able to hear me? So thank you, Swamiji, for a very enlightening speech, uh, for clarifying the purpose of life. Um, it was very interesting to see how great saints and great souls have always focused on humility and service to mankind. I sometimes approach life with a contrarian view. Many people have asked me, many youngsters I meet, regularly, they ask me, what is the purpose of life? In today's age of technology and today's age of instant gratification, it is normal for people to ask, what is the purpose of life? Our great saints and monks have always told us that the purpose of life is to find God. The purpose, is, purpose of life is to realize the self. <clears throat> In the Gita, we have been told by Lord Krishna that the purpose of life is to fulfill your karma, your duty, without expecting any rewards and to keep the mind focused on him. With so many different views, 
and thoughts. Sometimes it is normal for people to get confused and for youngsters to get confused. So I would just like to, what I think is the purpose of life and what I have discovered in my own journey. So growing up as a youngster, I thought the purpose of my life was to be the best doctor in the world. And that was my focus, to become the best doctor in the world. When I got all my qualifications and achieved all my training, I suddenly realized this was not the purpose of my life. So what is the true purpose of my life? Fortunately, I found my master early on in life, but finding your master does not mean that your trials and tribulations end. Finding your master does not mean that the roller coaster of the roller coaster ride of life ends. The roller coaster ride of life actually begins once you have found your master. He takes you on a roller coaster ride. He exposes your weaknesses to you. He exposes everything to you which you need to know and understand to be able to evolve and to be able to play a game very well. So coming back to it, is, was, it was important to express this particular point because I suddenly realized that medicine was not the purpose of my life. Service was not the purpose of my life. Humility was not the purpose of my life. So what is the purpose of my life? And over the years, as I meditated, and asked for soul guidance, I realized that the purpose of life was to play the role which you have been given by the cosmic master very well. And that, according to me, is the purpose of life. And how do we play that role very well? How do we know that this is our role in life and not something else? Again, it is through deep intuition, through guidance, through prayers and meditation, we start to understand what is our role in life. We can have multiple roles in life. At different times in our life, we can have a different role. And I started to realize that the purpose of my life was probably to have played each of those roles very well. And if I failed in playing any of those roles very well, I was failing in the purpose of my life. So when I became a father, I had to play the role of a father very well. And if I did not play that role extremely well, and remain focused on my career as a doctor, I would not be doing justice to the purpose of my life. <clears throat> so coming to the conclusion of what I'm trying to say, one day it, through deep questioning and through deep uh, uh, answering in my meditations, I got a small poem which I would like to read to you, which helped me understand what I felt was the purpose of my life and maybe it helps guide some of the youngsters who may be listening to this talk as to what their purpose in life is and what life is all about. This poem I call, A Promise I Bid Thee Give. In this cosmic circus on Earth's stage, O cosmic director, I play the role you bid. Villain or hero, maybe the clown, the actor is an actor still. A willing actor, an eager artist, I joyously play the role in this circus of thy creation. To entertain the master, the subjects too, bid me and I shall play. A patient father, a loving mother, a dutiful child or a loyal brother, maybe a devoted spouse or a trusted friend, a kind employer or an earnest servant, bid me and I shall play. Or is it the flaming devil you want me become, the vicious Hitler, so good me unite? Or oh, the ten head Ravan of yore, ruled one day by anger, hate, lust, envy, pride, the other by ego, lies, deceit, and greed, and violence wild, so the noble Prince Rama his victory may claim. Maybe the cruel Kamsa you want me to play, selfish to the poor, cruel to his kith and kin, for Krishna to crush the evil self. Or oh, the tempestuous soul one day, who in the desert you blinded to awaken the divine St. Paul within. Bid me and I shall play the role you want of light and dark on thy cosmic screen. But a single promise I must exact, one only promise I bid thee give, and I shall play the role you bid. I bid thee ever stand by me. I bid thee in my thoughts be always present. I bid thee in silence sit in the heart of my hearts 
So I hear thy silent whisper when darkness clouds my mind. Then for thee I play, the hero loved one day and villain despised the other. A single promise I bid thee give, in my silent heart thou shalt always stay. This poem helped me understand that and gave me the deep realization that this whole cosmos is the master's creator's cosmic dream. We are but his thoughts projected on the screen to play the role of good and evil. What is then free will? What is the real purpose of life? How much free will and choices do we really have? Is it a narrow remit or a wide one? When we are directed to play the role of evil, can we then play that role of evil with his thought in our minds? Knowing we are playing a role or do we get so steeped in the role that we forget the director? So if you think about Ravan, Ravan was a villain, but he always had Lord the God in his mind because he knew he was playing a role. So even though he had Sita in his kingdom for so many years, he never touched her. He always threatened, but never touched her. So he knew that his role had to be played properly and well. But when you look at Kamsa, because we have now come into the descending age of Dwaparyu, his mind had changed. He started to become the real villain and move away from the role that God had given him. So, uh, dear friends, what I would like to say that this whole universe is a master's cosmic game. The real purpose of at least my life is to try to play the, the game which he assigns to me or the role that he assigns to me very well. But if we keep his thought in our minds, then we will not be, we will know, not overstep our role and we will do what the role he So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjeev Kanoria. Thank you for sharing the lovely poem. Um, and of course, this wonderful philosophy is, we can absolutely, we share an empathy with the philosophy that you have, let's say this is so unique, it must be your, absolutely your own uh, device. Thank you once again. And with that, we come to the end of the first day of the 13th edition of the World Confluence of uh, uh, Spirituality, Humanity, Spirituality and Power. And tomorrow we start sharp at 3, Indian Standard Time, 3 p.m. Uh, for our viewers, you have the same link. So do join in thousands as you did today. And uh, for the speakers, of course, we would be sending out a different link. But for the viewers, this link remains the same. Hope to see you all at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Have a wonderful time. And do join us tomorrow at this very important event.